Um, so I went to this little private school on Merrick Boulevard, which is in the hood. And um, when I left there, I only went one year. And it was a weird school. Like LL Cool J went there, Tashina Arnold went there. It was a lot of other celebrities um, went there. But when I left, I went to a school. I tried to get into a school called August Martin because I all of a sudden when I was getting out of, out of, out of the eighth grade, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe I'll be a pilot. So um, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that this morning. Yeah. And, and Kyle West was like my my hero uh, when I started making music. That was I wanted to be I admired Teddy Riley, but I wanted to be more like Kyle West. I really liked his style. And then I waited and I moved out of the state. I moved from New York to New Jersey because that's where like all of the entertainers were moving. Like New Jersey became like the Beverly Hills of New York. <laughs> OK. Because, okay. you know, you could pay decent price, but you get a fireplace in the garage like that. Yeah. You know, that was foreign to, you know, to New Yorkers. We come from concrete. <laughs> from a young age, I, I always, without ever thinking about it consciously, I always subconsciously knew, like, you should always operate at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Always. Even if you lose everything, it doesn't matter. But you should not operate from a low level. Like, I did that once. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Once I made it here, I can't operate from here no more. I'm going to operate from here every time. So that's why I bought the computer, um, which was a really hard learning curve. I didn't care. I didn't have a life anymore. I just sat in New Jersey hiding out <laughs> and learned how to make music. <laughs> and I got a call from Paris that said, uh, well, well, I'm at 160,000 of the 100. And I was like, well, this is Miss 50-50. I'm cool with splitting this 50-50. I don't, I, this is the last check I need right now. I would literally lose checks for $50,000, $80,000 in my drawer. Literally, no lie. So I'm like, I don't care about this, but I'm not going to take less than 50%. You wanted 50% of this group. Now you want 60%? No, you still want 60% of the group, but you want 60% of that check. That's the same thing to me. Yeah. Those kind of things, it just wasn't going to fly anymore, you know, because I'm still using what I'm doing outside to come back and, and make us try to stay 50 50. Well, so those to, things, yeah. like, once those things start piling up yeah. and I'm having an amazing career outside of the group, mm. where my name is actually bigger than Groove Theory, it just, did, it just didn't make any sense. It was like, you guys had a good time. Y'all beat me up. I started this, but that's, you know, it's got to end at some point. Hey guys, I want to welcome you to another edition of Half Time Chat. Uh, I've got Bryce Wilson. I'm bringing him in. Hey. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? Yeah, doing well, doing well. Yeah, really so. appreciate this. <laughs> Are you on the East Coast? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Miami. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah. What has happened is that our, our clocks haven't turned. So I'm in England. And normally we're five hours ahead, uh, behind ahead, but we don't have our daylight savings until the end of the month. So, uh, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I I'm not sure how much of my sh of the show you've 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 seen or caught a at all. I just seen some of it. I just um I just got put onto it uh, like a week ago, and I, I just saw some of it. But it's, it's actually really interesting. It's cool. Yeah, really, you got going on there. Yeah, in fact, I didn't realize that you would when I was interviewing Jimmy Love that you were that that he he's that you were you were bound to tune in. So I thought it was a mistake, and it was only afterwards he told me that he wanted you to listen in. But I I thought I thought what was going on. I didn't know what was. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you joining in. Um, I I started this during the pandemic um, as a way of. Um, just reaching out and celebrating our artists, producers, songwriters. And I think we have, I've already interviewed almost a hundred, um, you know, oh, from wow. the producers like Rodney Jerkins, um, Brian Alexander Morgan, Elder Barge. It's, uh, in fact, I, I can't, I, right now I keep forgetting, but anyway, and so the whole, just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to watch, I got to watch the Elder Barge one. El, he's, he's deep. Yes, in fact, he talked a lot about stuff that Stevie Wonder from Quincy Jones, a lot of the stuff. Yeah, he talked about his childhood, writing songs like I Like and How Chico. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. But and he's and he's um on the low. That's that's who Babyface idolized. 
Yeah, I mean, he's probably the, the thing about L is that he's a very because I'm a therapist, I'm a mental health therapist. So mm -hmm. when I was interviewing him, I had to almost be like him. So he felt comfortable to talk and share and mm -hmm. and just talk about this life and, and stuff. But um, the whole idea is celebrating everybody. Um, um, Angie Stone just recently, I interviewed Angie Stone and Kathy Sledge. So it's just a mixture uh, of, of people to celebrate. Even Albert Shaw was on with Cal West just uh, two nights ago. So um I saw that yeah, I saw that this morning, yeah. I and mean, Kyle West was like my my hero uh when I started making music. That was I wanted to be I admired Teddy Riley, but I wanted to be more like Kyle West. I really liked his style. Ah, I mean I've so I've been, I've interviewed Kyle twice in the past week and 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 just because we, we had such a great time that you know we keep just saying let's just record another session just to talk about different things. So mm -hmm. um but I didn't realize he's so reclusive. But when you do interview him, he he just enjoys to share. And then I'll surprise him as well. But you know, for, for yourself though, uh, Bryce, I mean, you're somebody who when I told a few people that I was going to interview, they kept saying, oh, the guy from Mantronics. I was like, Mantronics? So I'd never heard of Mantronics. I remember you from Groove Theory, and I remember you producing alongside Babyface uh, and, and other stuff, and then and then doing some films and stuff. But um, but the whole idea is to really start, start from the beginning, just trying to see where you were uh, born and raised. So we can just start from the beginning. So where, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born and raised in New York City. I grew up between Jamaica, Queens, Brooklyn, and Washington Heights. Okay. Now, for those Queen of us who've never been in New York or been um, in the East Coast, does that sound like a large area, or is it just neighboring cities? It's 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 three different it's three different boroughs. My family's from Brooklyn. Um, we were the first or second family to um, start out in Queens. When when you're in New York, if if you're you're from Brooklyn. If you do good in life, you move to Queens. If you do better, you move to Long Island. Okay. That's, okay. Yeah, that's how that happens. But the but the Manhattan happened. My father and my mother got divorced when I was seven, and he moved to Washington Heights, which is a very popular neighborhood now. Um, La Marine is a big restaurant there. Um, you know, it's gentrified and everything now. Um, but it's a predominantly Dominican and Jewish neighborhood. Okay. Your family are they from the Caribbean, or did they? Or from a lot, from a lot of islands. Um, more Barbados than everywhere, but but like everywhere. Um, Trinidad, Bahamas, Jamaica, Guyana, Brazil. Okay. Everywhere. Yeah. Okay. And and so you say when your parents separated, um, did you move with your dad or move to your mom or? No, stay with my mother, but my father was really active. So he would take me, my two sisters, and my other two cousins, um, Candace and Alan. He would take all five of us. So he'd have five kids every two weeks. Wow. Pretty much by himself. And he'd just take care of us. Um, very present. He wouldn't, like, you know, take us and leave us and go off. He'd be active, always have things for us to do, always cooking for us, um, taking us to park, stuff like that. It was always an adventure every, every uh, two weekend, every other weekend with him. Wow. And then as a kid growing up in that area, what was your sort of interest or what are the kind of things that you, you got yourself into? Uh, well, it was the 80s and it was the crack era. <laughs> so yeah, Monifa was telling was, me about that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it was um it was probably it was definitely one of the most dangerous places in the plant on the planet, but it was yeah. also um just an extremely fast place. It was very fast paced. Um, for kids growing up, you know, when, when crack era came, every kid, not every kid, but so many kids became instant entrepreneurs um, because, you know, because the opportunity was presented, even though it was our government that presented it and punished us for it later. That was, that was the opportunity. Everybody was, um, you know, doing something that was involved in the, in the, uh, in the crack era. And those that didn't directly that weren't directly involved were just really thinking about survival. It was really, really dangerous times then for everybody. So stuff that we see in New Jack City, that that is, is it was even worse than that. Yeah. Yeah. New Jack City comes from um that comes from like the Supreme team in Queens, in South Jamaica, Queens. So yeah, those, those that's that's a spin-off of 
you know, things that really happened. I mean, as a kid, were you aware how dangerous it was and how were you able to sort of keep yourself sort of away from from fallen victims to stuff like that? Uh, I didn't do so well, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I didn't do so well. I, um, so I went to, I went to a, um, it was, it was weird. I, I was in junior high and my mother pulled me out because I was, I was getting a little bit of trouble. So she pulled me out, moved me into this private school, Wow, uh, which was like $1,600 a year, but it was a, it was a big deal for back then. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, my mother had a teacher's salary. Um, so I went to this little private school on Merrick Boulevard, which is in the hood. And, um, when I left there, I only went one year. And it was a weird school. Like LL Cool J went there, Tashina Arnold went there. It was a lot of other celebrities um, went there. But when I left, I went to a school. I tried to get into a school called August Martin because I all of a sudden when I was getting out of out of, out of the eighth grade, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe I'll be a pilot. Okay. So I couldn't. I didn't pass the test. Some whatever happened, they didn't accept me. <laughs> um, so I was like, well, I'll go to Andrew Jackson. That was the next choice. What I didn't want to do was go to the local school at that time for me, was, which was Springfield Gardens. I didn't want to go there because I didn't really like going to any of, any of the local schools. So I went to um, Andrew Jackson, which is a legendary school. Um, it was the first school in all five boroughs to have metal detectors, picture <laughs> IDs. Wow. Um, we had a task force full of gorillas, like gorillas jumping out the van on you like it was it was a, it was a crazy school um and it was like a jail it was 3500 students it was huge wow. and it was just a crime ridden ridiculous everybody was taking chances like it was it was that was definitely like when you see lean on me that was like a joke <laughs> next to Andrew Jackson Andrew Jackson was was it was a serious serious school so I went there for some reason I, I just thought it was a decent school I used my aunt's address because my aunt um, on my mother's side had moved from Brooklyn to Queens and I um, I used her address to be zoned in that school and I thought it was a, I thought it was a good school and I um, I immediately as soon as I got there I was like oh what is this it was, it was, a zoo. <laughs> it was like a prison mixed with a zoo wow. and um, I went there and I was I was a victim for about a month and a half and I had a, um, a homeboy Jeff that I was hanging out with and I used to beatbox because Rozelle from The Roots mm. lived on the corner of my block. So me and my man Ike, you know, we're young, but we're always trying to be like Rozelle. So I took whatever I learned from, from watching Rozelle over to Jackson. He kind of became a little bit of a celebrity. And I met this guy, Jeff, that was from um, from Hollis, Queens. And, um, you know, Jeff was like a, like a big brother. You know, big brothers beat you up, hang out with you, you know, let you hang out with the older kids, all of that. And um, but Jeff really, Jeff really did a lot for me because Jeff was the first um Jeff and my cousin John L were like my first alliances in that school. And you need alliances in that school. Wow. That school had Hollis, Farmers, South Side, South Side 17. It just had different crews all over the school, and they were, you know, they were beefing schools. Um, they were beefing um territories. So Jeff was the first person to really have my back and he had my back and I kind of took it overboard. So I just got into different games at that point. And I, school was just the last thing that I, you know, that was just the last thing on my mind. So after like a month and a half in New York, if you fail, you get a 55 and my report cards were five sevens and twelves. <laughs> and you get a 40 if you cut too much. So I was beyond cutting too much. I just didn't go anymore for like, months at a time. I wouldn't go to school for like three, four months at a time. Um, you know, doing silly stuff. But you know, th those times everybody was into something. You know, you into the drug selling, the robbing, but there's always some kind of hustle somebody was into. So yeah, I mean, you know, me and my sisters, we grew up dead center in the middle of that. But your mom being a teacher, was it just only so much she could do? Yeah. There was so there was only so much she could do. Um she was my my mother was strict with me. Um, she was strict with me, but when, you know, once you hit fourteen, you're, you're kind of like, you know, puberty hits you. You just it's just different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you're not you know, you I'm taller than my mother. It's, it's just different. You know, um, my father had just retired and started a new job. He was living on the other side of the city. Um, I, I I'll never forget my mother 
uh, one day I came home and she was crying and she was like, why are you doing this to me? And that got to me. That broke mm-hmm. my heart. Yeah. Um, and I said from there, I was going to change. And then I just, I just couldn't, you know, it's like, it's easy to say it when you walk outside your door and you get on that bus and it's, you know, it's just, it's a circus outside. It just is what it is. Um, so what my mother did was one day she took me, um, she took me clothing shopping in the middle of the year, which was weird. Cause you know, you usually take them shopping in September, right? Yeah. So she takes me clothing shopping now in, in New York, the kids that are from the hood hood, like the projects, they don't do good in school, but they dress fly. Right. <laughs> just in that in that social structure, right? So my mother took me shopping. So I felt like I won. I felt like, okay, she gets it. She's gonna leave me alone. Let me do my thing. You know what I'm saying? She's gonna make sure I'm fly. <laughs> so I didn't understand it, but I was, you know, I was happy. So the next morning, she comes in my room and she's like, you know, you okay? You like your clothes? I'm like, yeah, I like, yeah, thanks. She's like, okay, good, because um, I just want to make sure you're good, because you got to go. And I was like, what do you mean I got to go? She's like, you got to go. You got to get out of my house. Wow. So I'm 14. Um, I just had a lot going on in the street. I mean, a lot going on. When I see movies of dudes that just got the pressure from all sides, that was the typical kid that went to Jackson or or from the hood in New York. So I had all this stuff. So I called up a lot of my friends, like, yo, can I come stay with you? Damn, bro, I mean, I'm in mad trouble myself. So I really had nowhere to go. My grandparents um, were living in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Wow. They decided to move back to the States after I think like 15 or 17 years. Um, so I only knew I only knew my grandparents from, from when I went to the islands for like the summers and stuff, my mm-hmm. sisters. And um, they had just moved to Atlanta because we had an older cousin that moved there. Um, that Atlanta wasn't f- familiar to anybody in my family until my older cousin Tony moved there. So my um my grandmother um and, and grandfather moved there. That's as far as I knew, that's where they lived their whole life. Cause since <laughs> I was you know, since I was two months old, my mother was carrying me, you know, to the islands to go see them. So um they moved to Atlanta and I just had so much heat on me from every direction that I just Sat down and was like, yo, you you got to go down to your grandparents. So I just told my mother and father, I was like, right, I'll do it. I'll leave. And I went down to Atlanta. And then, um, you know, it, it was heartbreaking because at the time, like, um, like, I remember me and LL Cool J used to go on the bus every day. He rapping, I beatbox, and we were looking for Dougie Fresh, looking for um, Buffy from, from the Fat Boys, looking for Biz Markie, like, that was the battle era. You know what I'm saying? So oh. it was like this whole world is opening up of hip hop. And it was like in the middle of it, they just, you know, I just had to take myself out of it. So that was um, that was heartbreaking because moving to Atlanta was a, a hell of a, of a culture shock. Wow. I mean, so I mean, so you're about 14. So you said that you and LL we in the same school or just in the same neighborhood? Yeah. We, we went to the we went to the we went to the to the private school together, okay. um, which was called Crystal Robbins, and we both went to Andrew Jackson after that. Wow. Yeah. Then- so he was he was like three he was three grades above me, but I but I knew him from yeah. the old because the private school was kindergarten to twelfth grade. Ah, okay. So it was just a, it was just a weird school. It was just a, it was it was yeah it was weird very weird situation over there. At, at the time, just before you left New York, was um, was Sugar Hill Gang out and Curtis Blow? Um, were, were those yeah? Type of- Sugar Hill Gang was out way before then. Okay. Um, in elementary school, I remember them coming out, and Curtis Blow came out that year. Okay. Yeah, he came out that year because his DJ was AJ, and I used to wear this hat that said AJ Beatbox on it. For Andrew Jackson, so yeah, that was that was um that was the same year. Okay, so uh, who uh, no who? But so this is when hip hop was bubbling up with um. um uh, this is when hip hop was was spreading through New York, and when hip hop was actually um, it was this voice of our generation that we were loud and proud with. That we didn't give a shit, but nobody said like we just didn't care. Um, we 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 knew. We we knew that what we had was the hottest thing. It felt like the hottest thing in, in the country. Yeah. You know, we had a, our own style of dress, our own language, our own um 
our own um, art and our own music. But then how was that going beside uh, parallel to the, the crack epidemic? How was that? Was it almost a way of escaping that or was it a way of just communicating how it is? Or They were, they were all extensions of the same thing. You know, they were all extensions of the same thing. Um, you know, at, at that age, that's when we're like opening up to the world. Mm. You know what I mean? Where we can we go place without our parents. So at that age, that's when whatever borough you come from, we're all meeting up at 42nd Street, which was a movie in itself. That's when you hear about different places. You hear about Skate Key. Um, you hear about Empire, Brooklyn. You hear about um, Love People, Peyton Place. Um, you hear uh, America, you Club America. You hear about all of these different places. And you're getting on the trains and the buses and you're traveling all over the city, all over the five boroughs. But every borough is dangerous because you can get killed on the train. You can get wow. killed when you get off the train. You can get robbed. Um, you know, that, that was just a big thing. Everybody was robbing everybody. Everybody was shooting everybody. It was, it was just it was just pandemonium everywhere you went. Everywhere you went in them five boroughs, it was it was it was crazy. It, it, you tell a story that as if there was very there was little regard or value for life within the community, um, mm-hmm. and I would have thought it would be the opposite, where the, um, the 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 government and and all the stuff that was happening within New York was done by the, the system. So we need to stick together and support each other. But it seems as if all that chaos actually caused more division and 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 put everyone more in a survival mode instead of a united mode. Well, it was, it came in stages. It was, you know, you you had the epidemic and everything goes crazy. And then through hip hop, everything is, that's, that's the biggest influencer, you know, back then it was, it was, so it was, it goes from that complete destruction side to the self-destruction era, you know, where it's now it's this black awareness and now we're wearing, you know, you got half of the hood wearing gold chains saying, you know, I'm a king, this comes from slavery. Then you got the other (laughs) wearing a leather um, Africa, you know, Africa pendant. Yeah. So, so it, it's, you know, you're, you're watching this culture just evolve, you know, yeah. it, it started out as just a party scene and new ideas coming and creativity coming, and, you know, and we're trying to just get as much reach as possible. And then, you know, then it shifts and, and it shifts into the whole Africa movement and all of that. Um, wasn't, a, wasn't a big Caribbean movement back then. You know, you went to kids that were, Haitian, Jamaican, Trini, Guyanese, African, but you don't really know because the culture was just so strong. You wanted to be a part of that. You know, yeah. there wasn't. So you saw more of the culture in the household than outside. Mm. So. Did, did um had the show come out before you moved to Atlanta, before you had to move to Atlanta? Doggy Fresh, the show. Yeah. Was it... yeah. 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 That should have been out. And you know, in you know, you got you got to remember, there was no internet, there was no social media, there was no no quick demand. You know what I mean? And quick satisfaction. So every record that came out, if it was um, Kumo D, if it was The Treacherous Three, if it was um, Fearless Four, whatever it was, everybody can kind of. It was like a new sound was coming out every month. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Then the Pack Jam, like those kind of records, the, the um, Soul Sonic Forest, those kind of records. So it like this thing was really just being birthed at that time. It wasn't like people say, oh, cool, Herc invented hip hop. Yeah. He didn't invent hip hop. He created something that was pivotal in hip hop. Mm. But New Yorkers created hip hop. New Yorkers that were Latin, African, Caribbean and American. Yeah. So at this time, I was I was uh, I'd left England. I was living. I was going to high school, um, boarding school in Nigeria, and so a lot of the so Kumo D, um, Curtis Blow, a lot of those songs traveled across, and 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 you know we we, we and it was we, we you know we were influenced by even even Doggy Fresh and the, the the show, the storytelling and and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um. Did you and LL think about we can have a career into this, or was it just more like a a, a, a vocation just to pass away time? For me, it was it was a vocation, and that was the dream, right? The dream was to get a record deal. Oh, okay. For, for LL, he had um, 
Todd already had a record deal. Oh. I knew he had a record deal. I didn't hear the record. I just, you know, he had a record deal. He was super, super quiet about it. But he was super, super confident in who he was. You know, so it wasn't until maybe like a month before I left that I heard his first record. And I was like, and I couldn't believe it was coming from Todd. I was like, it just blew my mind, you know? So, of course, my first thing I wanted to do was find him now. Um, he, you know, he went on tour, he went on the road. I'm in Atlanta. I'm calling. I'm literally spent every dime I had putting like eight quarters, 16 quarters in to call this dude's house, <laughs> speak to his grandmother or his mother. He'd be like, Todd ain't home. He was telling Bryce call. Because uh, I, you know, I felt like yo, this dude got to come save me. Like I'm, I'm here now. You know, New Yorkers, we, we're a little arrogant. Anything south of New York, New Jersey is country to us. You know, <laughs> that's not really accurate, but that's just how. That's just that kind of yeah. you know New York arrogance. So I'm way past New Jersey. I'm in Atlanta. The style is different. They don't know nothing about hip hop down here. So it was, it was, it was, it was a culture shock for sure. Well, were you going to school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I started going to school there, and it was just it was just two completely different worlds. Yeah. They didn't like me. They, they started calling me Crush Guru. I didn't <laughs> like them because I thought they were country. You know, it was, yeah, it, yeah, it, it played out. But yeah, that was it was it was a weird experience. Did did you get into? But did you get into music while while you're in Atlanta, or at least while in school, or, or what were you doing to? Yeah, I did. I um. I went to a school in College Park. I remember Jermaine lived about five minutes from me. I remember going to Jermaine's birthday party. And his oh. parents bought him turn, uh, turntables he was DJing at. And I was like, damn, this dude is lucky. Like, his family <laughs> actually supports this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but everybody else's family is like, like, yo, <laughs> you will go, go to college and get a job, you know? <laughs> so I remember that. Um, and I remember the movement then in hip hop, hip hop didn't really reach there, but how it did reach was mostly like the Miami bass sound. Mm. It was more that fast thing. So, you know, we were very mid tempo in New York. All of a sudden it's like fast Miami bass thing came and I didn't like it cause I thought the lyrics were too simple. I didn't think it was <laughs> real rap. It was like, you know, just, you know, on some elitist New York thing, but, but you know, at the same time, like I'm watching the, the BMF series and I'm seeing how they first went to Atlanta and just bringing back memories. It was a scene. It still was. It was it was dope. It was just their way. You know, it yeah, was just it's how different. came to them because there was no Internet. They couldn't they had no eyes on what we were doing in New York. So yeah. to us, we're like, everybody's getting this shit wrong. Yeah. Houston, L.A., Atlanta, y'all got Jerry Curls, like <laughs> everybody's getting this hip hop shit wrong. So, you know, so. That's how it was for me. I was like, I'm not conforming. I'm not putting on um their style of dress was preppy back then. I was like, I ain't dressing preppy. I ain't putting on no no um button-down shirts, <laughs> loafers. Like, I'm not doing none of this stuff here. So yeah, it was it was a big culture shock. But then what do we, what you so the, but did you team up with people who like Jermaine or people who were in the music just to at least to keep keep the talent going while you were still out there? Yeah, I did. I had um I had Larry and Tony Basket were like my big brothers. They um really kind of kept my head on straight, helped me get out of that that uh that New York state of mind. We had a group. Um there was a guy named Chill down who was from down there. Um he was in the group. And then I also, my friend Jeff that was in New York, we had a um he had a connect to a DJ in Atlanta named Shy D. And Shy D was you know, he was our DJ. He was dope. And Shadi disappears. We're like, yo, where'd Pete go? I listened to the radio. He's a rapper now. He's <laughs> rapping what I wrote for the group we were in. Whoa. So at a very early age, I experienced two times somebody taking my lyrics and dashing with the record deal. No mention of me. And I'm I'm hearing my lyrics on the radio like, what's going on? So it was so yeah, I try I try my best. Um I tried my best until I was in the eleventh grade. My my grandparents had built another house about 45, 50 minutes outside of Atlanta. And wow. they just passed away two years ago. Oh. But this is like in the eighties. They're like, yo, we don't know how much longer we got left. They were gonna wait to move once I graduated. And they were in eleventh grade, they was like, yo, we don't know how much time we got left, so we will go now. 
So and he just passed away two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Of like 94, God. 98. Yeah. Wow. So I moved with them in really into the country. It was a place <laughs> called Villa Rica, and it was really the country. Um I, I went to school there and the um went to school there and the kids were chewing tobacco and I never seen that before. <laughs> Like, like baseball players. <laughs> yeah, it was like crazy to watch. You know, these are, you know, these are teenagers. And um, there was a teacher in my class that pulled the paddle out on me, like to beat me. <laughs> late, right? So he pulled out the paddle. I went crazy. My grandfather had my back. I was like, yo, if you touch me with that paddle, I'm going to fuck you up. Every teacher in the school, I, I became famous in an hour. Everybody in the school knew <laughs> from New York. It's crazy. <laughs> but that's just how um that's just how suppressive that system was outside mm. of the city. You know what I'm saying? Where students would fucking sit there and let the teacher paddle them. So <laughs> I went home and um and I thought about it and I was like, yo, you ain't never gonna make a record living down here. Like there's no way. You're not even in Atlanta anymore. Like you like it's just not gonna happen. So I picked up the phone, I called my mother. And I said, listen, if you don't let me come home, I'm going to kill myself. And if you <laughs> think I'm playing, just watch. I won't be here no more. And I was really, I was really that serious. I was like, this, this, this ain't it for me right now. It was, it was you know, it's one thing to be in Atlanta. It's a whole nother thing to be, you know, I see cows and shit on the way to school. <laughs> like, it's just too much. So I told my mother that. And she was like, no, you're finally doing good and you're doing better and all that. I was like, listen, I'm doing good. I'm going to do good in New York. But I, I got I to gotta get out of here. So she was like, all right, just pack your shit. And then she let me come back up to New York. Wow. So what changed when you became back? What changed in you when you returned? Nothing. <laughs> well, I got in more trouble in New York. Um, the, the thing that I had going for me was I had to connect I met this guy in Atlanta that worked for a label, um, the label that Medtronics was on. Okay. And um, I met him while I was in Atlanta. So when I came up to New York, I hit him up and, um, you know, I'll go up to the label. He was, he was full of it, but he did bring me up to the label and they did hear me. So um, when me and him had a fallen out, I just couldn't, just couldn't deal with that dude. Um, Mantronic had finally left the label because I, because I made it to sleeping bag. They said they wanted me. Um, they said they wanted me in the group in Mantronics. Yeah. But there was a rapper already in there. They said, so we're going to work out how to get him out, but we're going to replace him with you. And then I had the guy that introduced me to them that was blocking. So I sat for maybe like six, seven months, just like, it's just not happening. And I got a call from, um, from Mantronics uh, attorney who was like, you remember me? I was like, yeah. What's up? Why are you calling? He was like, well, he's not a sleeping bag. He's on Capitol. He just signed the first million dollar deal in hip hop. Do you want to get down? And I was like, yeah. And then I started everything. So, okay, so you, uh, can I know you were in sleeping bag? Joyce, and I interviewed Joyce Sims before she passed. Wait, did, you're on the same label with her at the time? Well, I was on Capitol. So I was with him when he left sleeping bag. Oh, oh, so my yeah. left super um left sleeping bag. Okay. Yeah, went to Capitol. Okay. Yeah. But um but but in between that time, because when you moved back to New York, had had Todd released um, you know, I Need Love and I'm Bad, had he released all that stuff? Um, I think he released I think yeah, he released I'm Bad and all of that because I saw him again and um we were hanging out and he played me, uh, mama said, you know, knock you out. And I, and I went, he was building a house on Long Island and I went out there with him and he had, mama said, knock you out all over the fucking wall, spray paint. I was like, what does this mean? <laughs> and he told me and he played me some records. So that was, yeah, like my last year of high school when I was back in New York. So, I mean, so you must have seen that, okay, he's, that this is going to, this is actually going to make money because you've seen he's actually doing stuff like did that sort of motivate you to say man I need to get my act together or and no it ain't it didn't make me say I gotta get my act together it just made me want it more okay. you know because somebody that was close to me did it um you know I saw the you know I saw I saw LL do his thing um um 
Pepper, Sandy from from Salt and Pepper was um, her and my sister and another girl, Sonia, were best friends. So I was seeing people close to me that were making it. That wow. would make so it made me it made me work on my skill set, but it didn't make me like change any of my behavior, any of my patterns, or anything. I I went hard in two directions at the same time, and school was just ignored. My goodness, I mean, and I, 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 at at that time, were people making money in in the music industry enough to say all or nothing? We can actually make a big career out of that and leave the crack at the side. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the artists that were doing well. I mean, as far as from where we can see, you know, yeah, if the artist is wearing the big chains and driving the nice car like the drug dealer, he made it. Yeah, that was it was as simple as that. You know, you got big chains on a four finger ring, and you driving a brand new Audi or Cherokee or whatever, you made it. You know, we don't we don't even we never even thought about where do they live or any of that stuff. <laughs> what that is about. You know, it wasn't about that. It was about what they had. It was about what they were flashing, you know. So, yeah, it seemed like they were making enough to, you know, to be on their own, like making enough to to make it a career, you know. And then when I signed with Mantronic, he had a million dollar deal. He was had a uh, a penthouse in, in the village, in Greenwich Village. He was chilling. So my immediate perspective was from him, you know, and he was he was doing great. But then he... he... So when they talk about a million dollar deal, I, I, I guess did did you get to learn what that really meant? Being having a million dollar deal, did it, it didn't mean that here's a million dollars and we're gonna get and and or what did it really mean? Well, when I first heard about it, or when when you don't really understand the business, you think somebody gets a check for a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. When you get a little deeper, you think oh, okay, they got a million dollars, but they got to pay for the album. But what it really usually is is usually um, it's usually just talk. It's usually they, what they'll do is they'll take each album, which is a term of the contract, and they'll combine the budgets of it. So say if you have a four album deal for $250,000, okay. that can be quoted as a million dollar deal. You know, okay. Jay-Z does a $150 million deal with Rock Nation doesn't necessarily mean he got a check for $150 million. You got to perform and, and deliver certain things and those things have to perform to a certain rate yeah. or you to you know for you to live out the rest of that deal, and if you lived it out, then yeah, that much money was spent on you. Okay, and so, but at at were you fortunate enough to start to learn about the business when you joined Mantronic, so that at least you you kind of understood publishing and and you know because you said somebody took your lyrics and uh, earlier late early on, so at least mm -hmm. did you get a chance to then start learning the ins and outs in in in, in not being a front man. But being in uh, brought in. No, I learned. <laughs> I don't know if, the, if it's still happening now, but the way you really learn in, in the record industry is you hit. You either hit a wall or you hit a plateau. When you hit a wall, your lawyer sits down and tells you, "Yeah, this is why you're screwed." And then you learn that part of the contract, this thing that you signed already, right? That he told you <laughs> it's okay to sign. I'm the if same you, lawyer. <laughs> Yeah, same lawyer. If you plateau and you reached, you know, higher than what was expected, you sit down and he tells you the same thing in a different way. Oh, <laughs> you did good, so you can get this, but no, all of this you can't get. So that's so really by by that trial and error of having successes is how I learned. In in Mantronics, um, Curtis had my publishing. I didn't know what it was. I used to always ask, like, what the hell is publishing? What's publishing? And there was a uh, there was a young lady Karen Durant that worked at a publishing company that I, that I had met through a friend of mine, and um, she had offered me a publishing deal, and I kept asking like, "What's publishing? What's publishing?" When I found out what it was, I didn't really know exactly what it was, but I knew it was some money. And I knew <laughs> it, was, it belonged to me, you know. So I talked to um, I talked to Mantronic, and we worked it out, and he gave me the publishing back, and then I went and did my first publishing deal, and then once I did that deal. Um, once I did that deal, I had a falling out with the company, but I, I met Amel through that, through that arrangement. And, um, once we had a hit is when I really started learning, you know, that's when I, because the, the president of the company gave me, I was in London and he called me, he was like, oh, you're doing great. We got a, we got a nice check for you. We got a hundred thousand dollar check for you. I was like, okay. And I kept thinking on the way home, like, why are you giving me a hundred thousand dollars? Don't really make no sense. 
I know the record's doing good, but why are they giving me 100? So I went to see him in, in LA. And he was like, you know, I know you don't want it, but and he handed me the same $100,000 check. I was like, cool. I was like, well, if you're serious about that, then you treat me like a nigga that just walked in your office with a hit record. And then that started the renegotiation. So I took that contract on my flight home from LA and I read it. And I went through every page and just certain things were just kind of hit my common sense, you know? And then certain things I didn't understand. So I put a question next to those, but I, I basically commented on like 27 pages of the contract. Wow. I um, gave it to my lawyer and he was like, what's your problem? You got $300,000. <laughs> Exactly what you asked for. Why? Like, what's your problem? What are you asking for all of this stuff? I was like, I'm asking because this is what I need. So I got a hit record. I got more on the way. Go give it back to them. So he did. I got everything I wanted. And then I fired his ass because I, <laughs> you, know, you start to understand like everybody's kind of, yeah, in the same, yeah, rooting with each other, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's how you really learn. You either learn by hitting a wall and it's a disappointment or a plateau when you learn how to make. The negotiations or, or the clauses, adv you know, advantageous to you. But then, what make? I've, I said I've interviewed over a hundred people, and n most of them haven't had that sense of, apart from Joyce Sims, who actually read a book before she signed her deal. So she was like, "No, nah, it's not in my book, so I'm not." So she kept her all hip stuff. What made it different for you that you, that you just didn't just see oh hundred thousand and just go spend it. And, and really said, took your time to really think about fruit. Honestly, I think it's just like that New York state of mind is you always think somebody's trying to play you, to be honest. And it's so much of it is in our imagination. So much of it is over the top and unnecessary. Mm. But that was a situation where it was true. That was a situation where you start to understand this is a system, just like the legal system. This is a system with all of these hidden traps that we don't know. So I'm going to find out. And I knew I got money in my pocket. So why am I going to take $100,000 before I find out? You know, like I've seen it happen with boxes, with, you know, people on the street. Like, I'm not going to let you buy me for 100 when I could be worth way more than that. You know, so it just, it just made me think, like, what are they hiding? How are they? Where are they trying to play me at? And I just took it on myself to just read the language and just figure it out. Yeah, um, I heard... Um... Um, DJ Clint Clark, when he 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 said he was at um, Sylvia Rohn hired him at um, at um, Atlantic um, uh, East West, and he when he got to the other side, he knew that look at the business side, and she says you don't tell them about the business; it's up to them to learn about it, and if they don't learn about it, then that's their problem. Yeah, and and he was like, wow, and then even the lawyers. Are already part of the you know the lawyers don't want to lose out on the business so they're going to say it's a standard contract doesn't mean it's a good one it just is, they use the word standard exactly and it really caught me that it's it's it was predominantly done to black artists who just were just happy to get a deal and then it's mm -hmm. later on they find out that things were were, were, were wrong um yeah. especially as you mentioned with your lawyer but it but very few of them had the sort of the um the foresight like yourself to, to not get in all of a hundred thousand. And I don't know if it's leaving to Atlanta and, and going through that sort of style, if that's played a part, just that hustling to get back into it, that you just weren't going to take anything. I don't know if that. No, I think it was, I think it was the way I was raised. Um, my family's always about accountability and always, um, you know, you can't just do something and not think about it. Because wherever you land, it's, you better own that you you know you made that stupid decision. So I think it was it was the way I was raised, and I just really have a thing with um, being treated unfairly. You know, like I just have I just I just have a thing with that, and also being a producer puts you in a much better position professionally than being an artist mm -hmm. because you are the business side of making that record. You know, you're the one that usually self funds it. Mm -hmm. uh, brings in you know musicians um engineers mix engineers you know you you're the one that handles all of that stuff even even though i had people working for me that did it i understood every single piece of that so mm -hmm. when you understand every single piece of your process in making this record that makes you want to understand every piece of the process on their side 
Yeah. What the marketing team does, sales, radio, um, distributors, business affairs. You want to see how all of that breaks down. Mm-hmm. And all of that breaks down into um, different silos that all have tricky things going on, right? So if you're a manager, you have to figure out how to make all of these different silos work together, work in unison, right? Same way you figure out how they work in unison is the same way you can figure out how they screw you over in unison. <laughs> you know? So it's, yeah, I mean, that's 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 just the important part. I wasn't just like an, you know, I was an artist in Mantronics, but w- when it came to Booth Day, I was, this was my baby. This was my project. I put it together. So I wanted to really um, understand what the hell was going on. But before we get to Groove Theory, because I know that I didn't realize that, you know, got to have... Um got to have your love it's such a big track but um how did that because you 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 were there with that time but you weren't rapping so how did that so how did you guys sort of develop the sound was were you like soul to soul or what was mantronics with with a rapper and and producing the music that what was, was it? that was old curtis that was um mantronic it was his group i mean i basically took groove theory the idea of groove theory really stems from mantronics you but know. what was your role in Mantronics then during My when role you in Mantronics was I was the rapper. Okay. I replaced MCT. Mm-hmm. I was the rapper. He was the DJ and the producer. Um, but I was blessed to be with a DJ producer that can do R and B as well. Oh. You know, because he had, you know, Joy Sims, Hanson and Davis, No Sierra. He had so many hits. And then he got Just Ice Cold Getting Dumb, which was the hardest, one of the hardest records I've ever heard. Mm. So I was very privileged to be signed to a guy that was hugely responsible for dance music and hugely responsible for the mixing of hip hop and R&B. You know, he was by far one of the pioneers of that, you know? So, so being signed to him is where um, as an artist, I was just exposed to so much more than, you know, I, when I came up, I was, I hated being in Mantronics. I, I was happy for the opportunity, but I hated like this different left thing we were on because I was just a hood dude. I wanted to be like, you know, nice and smooth, Big Daddy King, rock him. Like that's, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's all I knew. Okay. He okay. put me in a different lane. I was like, what is this? Oh, she's singing and I'm rapping like, you know, <laughs> on a, a fucking suit. It was just, it was just, you know, it was weird. And then we got to go to Europe. Like the white man, you know, like what? <laughs> you know, but you know, but I'm I'm super I'm super grateful to him because he literally exposed me to the world, music wise, producer wise, and just to the world in general. Like I saw the world at a super young age. What about the did, did so did because you you never mentioned about the how you learned to be a producer? Was it when you were watching him? Do we go into yeah. the studio? Was that how it was? Yep, watching him. I would, um, I started, um, I, I think I just did what most artists do. You start to get a little ungrateful, a little um, carried away, and maybe you wanted everything. And I just started like watching him. He had this, he had this keyboard that produces, he had a lot of his equipment the average person didn't have. And he had this big ass keyboard that was like $26,000. It was like this wow. big, huge called the emulator three and I was sitting in his room while he's making beats and he's literally one of the best producers on the planet like in in London and Europe this guy is God so so it's not like the level that I was watching or hearing was a low level it was elite level you know yeah and I would watch like him truncating the sample I watch how he'd hit it and I watch how he moves this slide and I can hear oh it's moving it up closer to the sound he wants, you know? Mm. But all of those little things that I did, that I watched him do, is what I took on. I just woke up one day and I was like, I want to be him. I don't want to be me no more. I want that dude's job right there. So I just, um, I left the group and I called him. I was like, you know, what kind of um, equipment should I get? Oh, did, me- you, did you tell him that you wanted to leave and why you wanted to leave? Oh, is it just, you just... <laughs> no, we just, we just, we just kind of had it out. Um, you know, the publishing issue and all of that stuff. Okay. He was, you know, he was he was bigger than the group was, you know, so he was fine. He could produce whatever he wanted. Um, for me, I just felt like it was time for me to grow, you know. So I just called him. I was like, 
what equipment should I buy? He gives me, a, he told me to go buy a computer and a system that costs like $10,000. <laughs> I was like, damn. But I did it. I went and I bought it and I sat in my house for a year, year and a half, teach myself how to produce. And I taught myself by trying to recreate all of Teddy Riley and Kyle, and Kyle West beats. That's exactly <laughs> how I started. Are you serious? So, yeah. I sat like I would sit, I would sample the smallest sound from there. I don't care if it was a snare and it had a bass sound on it, a kick with a piano sound on it. That's where I started. And I would just keep searching until I could isolate their sounds. And then whatever I did, I would now take their sounds and try to recreate what they did, what they did. And then when I understood what New Jack Swing was, I was like, all right, now I want to kill it. Now I want to go completely left from all of this and do something that sounds different. Well, now I thought most people had an MP3s and, and samplers. So you didn't you didn't go that direction. I had a I had a I had an MPC. Um I had an MPC, but it wasn't MPC couldn't do what the computer did there. Wow. You know, yeah, I was signed to a guy that was just more advanced than everybody. So that's because I've where, never heard anyone talk um, about computers, uh, producers in those early days. Um yeah. Teddy, Teddy used the computer. It was it was a sequencer called Vision back then, um, and a sampling platform called Audio Audio Media. Um, Teddy used it and Curtis Mantronic used it. Those are the only two producers I knew at the wow. time. So you went, you went big time. Wow. And so how are you surviving while learning to do this? <laughs> how was I surviving? Uh, I had a friend. I had a friend out of Brooklyn and he had a couple of businesses in Brooklyn and Queens. And um, I was like the shorty in the crew. And um, he got killed while I was ending high school. I had sixty thousand dollars to give to him. He died. I was like, you know, I don't know where to give this. So I got really quiet. I was like, I don't know if these dudes know that I got this money. I don't know if they don't know, but I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna shut up. And then I, I, I remember I got a car, and then I waited and I moved out of the state. I moved from New York to New Jersey, because that's where like all of the entertainers were moving. Like New Jersey became like the Beverly Hills of New York. <laughs> okay. Because, okay. you know, you could pay this in price, but you get a fireplace in the garage like that. Yeah. You know, that was foreign to, you know, to New Yorkers. We come from concrete. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I went and I did that. I had that money and then I did the publishing deal with Karen. Okay. So, took, you know, I had a bag of cash and I had checks coming in every quarter and I just self-funded myself from there. Okay. Okay. So you, you didn't miss... Um, doing actually, so you you took your time before you put out stuff. So you didn't think I I need to be out there. I need to put on music. I need to do do some shows or mm. what was. I just followed what I knew. You know, I followed what I knew from Curtis. He was an elite level talent, and I was like, I you know, I traveled with him. I traveled the world. I performed with him. This is you know, so so from a young age, I I always. Without ever thinking about it consciously, I always subconsciously knew like you should always operate at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Always. Even if you lose everything, it doesn't matter, but you should not operate from a low level. Like I did that once. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Once I made it here, I can't operate from here no more. I'm going to operate from here every time. So that's why I bought the computer, um, which was a really hard learning curve. I didn't care. I didn't have a life anymore. I just sat in New Jersey hiding out. <laughs> and learn how to make music. <laughs> yeah, but then at, at this time, did you decide to give up being a rapper and just say, I want to start to produce? And then how are you thinking about getting the artist to produce? Or did you have a, a plan as to what you, if you want to master the computer, the production, what you do next? I had, um, I had a plan. I wanted to do something like Mantronics. Okay. That's all I knew, you know, so I wanted to get a, a female singer. I wanted to be like Curtis more than anything. I just wanted to be like, you know, Mantronic. I just wanted to do my version of, you know, what I what I saw him do. Um, so I wanted to do that. The publishing company I was signed to um, started giving me problems. They were like, we don't understand what this is that you 
gave us. Like we don't like it's a track. We get that, but we don't understand where, where this is going. So Karen Durant, um, Amel was her assistant. Wow. Yeah. So she was like, um, you remember Mel, right? From the office. Like, yeah. She was like, yo, she can sing. I was like, all right. She's like, no, like, she's dope. Like, you should try her out in music. I said, all right. And me and Mel were cool. So I brought her out to Jersey, put a mic in the bathroom. And she wrote something to a track that me and my friend Daryl made, um, who Daryl played on, um, Daryl Brown played on most of the group there stuff like 90 percent of it okay um he was older than me but very very well versed in, in every instrument so me and him he'd come over every day we just make tracks so um me and daryl put her in in the um, bathroom and she started singing and we were just blown away like all of a sudden all these ideas i had here because i, I see music in colors and pictures mm. so i know what i want when i'm making it but on the other side, the you know the melody and lyric side is not my thing. Okay. I never, I never explored it. And all of a sudden, she sung to this, and everything just made sense. Like every single track I did started to make sense. And that's mm-hmm. when I was like, it needs to be her. Wow. So, so then, did she? Was she okay? Was she still working with Karen while you guys were demo uh, coming up with the stuff? She was working for Karen shortly for a short while after. Um she got fired. I don't I don't know what for, but um she didn't have the job anymore. And then um I just started just sustaining the group. I just started, you know, paying my bills, paying her bills. You know, um, because that's what I saw Curtis do with me. Oh. What about how did the name did you already have the name or how did you come up with the name Goof Group Theory? I think I had the name a little before Amel came on. I think, I, yeah, I did have the name before she came on. It's just the same as Mantronics. Mantronics is human with electronics. You know? <laughs> so okay. the theory was something kind of organic and loose and whatever and swingy. And theory was something that's, you know, the technical aspect of it, you know? So you wanted to mirror what Mantronics was. So you you knew that you it was going to be a producer with with a with a singer, mm-hmm. okay. Um, once you got a mail, um, how, how, did did you just work on demos before looking for a deal, or how did how how does how does that journey go? So there's there was a guy met named Paris Davis, who dudes from Brooklyn, um, actually two blocks away from where my grandmother lived. Um, okay. I didn't know that at the time, but. Paris, he was a cool dude. He was older. He knew just know a bunch of girls. Knew, <laughs> you know, like Puff and and um uh Puff, Andre Harrell, Jimmy Love, he knew all of those dudes. Um, I didn't know any of these guys. Oh. So I met a lot of them through Paris. And um Paris, I gave him the top floor to I had a townhouse, four stories, right? Wow. And the top floor was just sitting there. I was like, if you want, you can stay up there. So he stayed up there, and while he was there, he was like, yo, I like what y'all doing. I might be getting this job over at Epic. I was like, all right, well, then you might want to sign us. <laughs> Upstairs is free. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so we we went through our thing with Paris. Um, Paris is such a cool dude, but he's like, for an A&R, he's an artist himself. He's just as left and crazy as any artist. <laughs> um <laughs> So, you know, we go out through, through our ups and downs and our fights and everything. And Paris introduced me to one of his friends, Jeff Burroughs. And at that time, Paris wasn't really checking. He was like, whatever, child, make some better songs. His friend Jeff liked it and called Benny Medina. So we went out to um, L.A., met with Benny Medina, and um, Benny loved it. As soon as we walked in his office, he knew every single word to every song. What? Mm-hmm. It was like, you know, it was it was good, you know, because we were kind of getting beat down. It was good to go to L.A. and somebody just, you know, loved the stuff. So when that happened, of course, that caught the attention of Paris. Paris going crazy, like, I helped put this together. How could y'all? <laughs> so then it was like, all right, Paris, you got, you know, pull out all the stops. Get Tommy Matola. So he brought Tommy Matola in. Wow. And Tommy was like, um, oh, in between this, I had also um, partnered up with Jimmy Henchman. At the time, because Jimmy had a group called um, 
Jimmy Henchman and Peter Thomas from Housewives of Atlanta. Okay. Or partners. And they had a company and they had a group out of London called Rhythm and Bass. Um, who, you know, Wayne from the group is is really like the, they're they're rock stars now, they're huge writers now, they, they're killing it. But we gave them Tell Me First. Wow. And came out on Epic in the UK, didn't do well. So we had that. So now the team is really me and Jimmy because when my money started getting dry, Jimmy just started helping with me self-fund this thing. So um, you know, we took care of everything. And um when when we saw Benny Paris got a little pressure from that, he brought in Time with Tola. Tommy was like, What do y'all want? We was like, We want this much money, we want this, this, this. And I was like, and give him Mel a publishing deal. He said, That's all you want? Got on the phone, got everything. Did, did you think that you could write some more? Or, did, or, or, or what was it? I mean, did you? <laughs> yeah, we got more, for sure. We definitely, we definitely got more. We definitely, those days you get like 300000 350, we got like 600000 for a record deal. So 500, something crazy. So we got everything we wanted because, we, you know, Paris put us with um with Tommy. So we go to sign the deal and um, Amel's attorney, Amel's like, you got to, you know, see my attorney. I'm like, for what? She's like, I don't know. I'm mean, just fine. All right. I'm dropping her off. I forget about it. Next day, she's like, hey, my lawyer is hitting, uh, you know, what time? All right. I go down there. I get to her lawyers, and he's like, this ain't happening. She's not signing to you. Because she was supposed to sign to my production company, and my production company does the deal. Mm. What I did with Curtis. He's like, she's not she's not signing this. I was like, why is she not signing this? So he's like, well, because this should be 50-50. I'm like, how? I've been spending all my money. I've done this before. I put this shit together. Like, what are you talking about? I look over at Amel and she's just looking at the floor. And I'm like, yo, what's wrong with this dude? She's like, I don't know. I'm like, what do you want to do? She's like, I don't know, but I got to listen to my lawyer. So I'm feeling like I'm 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 just feeling real uneasy, like somebody's pulling the wool over my over my eyes. So I curse him out. Because he's telling me this doesn't happen in groups. I said, it's never happened. He said, well, CNC Music Factory. I said, yeah, CNC Music Factory, Soul to Soul, and Mantronics, stupid. I was in Mantronics. You can't tell me nothing about this. So he's like, oh, okay, that is interesting. I'm like, yeah, so she needs a sign. I go into the other room, into the conference room, we take a break. My lawyer gets on the phone. My lawyer was in Atlanta. He gets on the phone. He's like, look, this is the deal. Benny Medina offered a mail a solo artist deal because he didn't like you telling him no. Oh, shit. So that's when I started understanding uh, this is chess. I get it. So I just had to eat my pride. You know, this is something that I was working on before Mel came in the picture. So I had to really assess the value of doing this deal versus not. And I was like, bro, you can't start over. You can't go find a new singer, go do new music like and she's dope. This how you know you're not gonna find somebody like her. Like this is just a lot. So I went back in the room, and I was like, "All right, well, Mel's gonna owe me over sixty thousand dollars, but you know, let's do it. Let's sign the deal." And then we signed the deal with Epic. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I I just I was gonna ask you because Jeff Burrows was he not the one that signed um, A Marie? Uh, I don't know. He was president of Bad Boy for a while though. Yeah, yeah, I I I worked at uh, with um, Edmonds Entertainment for a while, and he he he, okay. he was he he was there. He signed yeah. it. Yeah, so I yeah. I know Jeff. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, I was, wow, and Benny. Yeah, so so yeah, so they tried to. Wow. Yeah, Benny. <laughs> me and Benny are good friends. I understand. <laughs> like that's that was just my introduction to the big boys. You know. Wow. You know, no, you know, I wasn't mad at it. Benny's Benny's a good friend. I think Benny's a. a a genius, super, super smart guy. But then how come you didn't have a lawyer like a male had when you were getting signed with the Mantronics? I mean, <laughs> you, know, you, know, like... you know what's funny? <laughs> My lawyer, well, well, think about this, right? I'm a kid from New York. <laughs> I don't know lawyers. Yeah, yeah. I don't got no lawyers on my block. You know what I'm saying? I ain't got no lawyers <laughs> in my community. I don't know no lawyers. So my first lawyer was um, Mantronics 
attorney was Steve Shapiro, who's a who's a big entertainment attorney. Steve gave me my lawyer. <laughs> He's a apprentice. professor. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a good thing. He's like, oh, this guy's great. He was, he was my teacher. I'm like, oh shit, I, I got the teacher. I got an advantage. <laughs> Wasn't no advantage. Um, his name was Seymour Fag. I think I don't know if he had dementia or what, but it was like <laughs> he was a character and he just made me sign whatever, to be honest, you know. Um Amel Amel's lawyer wasn't a great lawyer. He was just, you know, lawyers are deal makers or deal breakers, and hers was a deal breaker. Mm. You know, I think he was looking out for his client, but I think he also was trying to direct it somewhere where he can get a bigger check and have more control. Yeah. What was going on. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, how did that affect the relationship between you and Amel at the very beginning when this is happening? How does that affect the relationship? It affected it. Um, it affected it because when I, when that, the day that that happened, I told her that day, I said, from here on, I don't hire or fire nobody for you and you're on your own. Like, from here on. Because everything I've done for you is clearly nothing. So, I don't mind doing 50 50. But you go do 50 50 for real. You go do your own 50. Take care of all the business, handle it, you know, for, you know, handle it for yourself, you know, because I was kind of acting as producer and manager at the time, you know. So it 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 affected us. Um it affected us. I think that for me, I think that was the first straw. You know, that we're that here we are, we're finally getting the deal we wanted so bad, and all of a sudden you going left and you're actually willing to leave this situation to go sign a solo deal. It's not like she had a producer signed up, but you know, it's Benny. So yeah, he was President Warner. He could have told I'll give you every top producer in the world at that point. Who knows? Yeah. Wow. I mean, cause I, as I said, there's a human element of, wow, of feeling betrayed, but then, but still going along with that and, and, um, and how the chemistry would be affected um, in the creative parts. It was more. That it was war. That was the first. That was the start of the war. Wow. Was, yeah. Uh, on reflection, what 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 would you you know? On reflection, what do you think this you could have done differently to understand her naivety, but and and but still not have it affect the creativity and 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 the group in the longer term. When you look back at at this stage of your life. Well, I think that I don't think it affected the creativity at all. It just affected our personal relationship. Yeah. You know, um, around that time is when I also introduced her to her husband, which her husband is a good friend of mine as well. Um, so then I think it became. I think just from 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 when that lawyer came in from what he did and then when she got married, I just think from there, just silently, like sides start to form. You know what I mean? Jimmy's with me, for sure, no matter what. He loves Mel. He took care of her, all that. But I brought Jimmy into the situation. Jimmy helped me fund this. Me and Jimmy are going to be on the same side at all times. And then with Mel, you're married to LaRue. You're going to be on that side for all times. LaRue's going to be with her at all times. So it kind of, um, it kind of just naturally, business just kind of naturally causes some kind of divisiveness and some kind of um, divide. With you know within the within the the crew, wow. but as I said in reflection though, could you could you, if you older and wiser, what would you have could you have what would you think you might have done differently to sort of? Mm. I, I really don't know what I could have done. I think the only thing I could have done was save some of my money so I could stand strong on my decision. That was it. But where where would it get me? But then we wouldn't have an album. You know what I mean? So I don't really. That it didn't it didn't make me resentful towards her where I acted on it. Okay. I acted on it much later because of other things. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't it. That that just that just, you know, that just fundamentally it made us 50-50. I, I didn't really care too much because music wise, we are doing 50-50. I'm doing the music, she's doing the lyrics and yeah, singing. Yeah. You know, so I wasn't mad about the split. I was more mad about the what to me was disloyalty at the mm -hmm. time. And um, and just being covert and not discussing it with me and talking it out with me. Yeah. Not that that would have went far as, you know, <laughs> as it wouldn't have. But but still the attempt, you know what I mean? I could I could look back and I could respect the attempt instead of using the lawyer dude to do it. I just didn't like that. Yeah. 
when, when you first when you when you do the album, um, how long does it take after you sign that the album is finished and ready to go out? The album was done, I think, in about probably a little over a year. Wow, be like thirteen months, something like that. Yeah, so we were album was done, mixed and mastered, and then we had the second strike. Which was, and it's it's not bad that it happened, but the way that it fucking happened wasn't cool. Um, we finished the album, and um, and it, it actually turned into a blessing, to be honest. We finished the album, and we have this, um, you know, they put all these earth tone colors on us and shit. I'm like, okay, whatever. It was just stuff. I it was like we were creatively pulled in like image things that. I didn't really like, and I don't think a Mel liked. Mm-hmm. And um, we had a photo shoot in New Orleans, and it was like a 25,000, 30,000 photo shoot, which, which was a lot for them. Planned everything out, had a hot photographer, and then we were supposed to have a meeting the next morning or leave the next morning, but I think it was a meeting. And I go to the label like nine in the morning, super early, and the Mel doesn't show up. We're like, okay, she's late. She's an artist, fine. It's 11, 30, 12 o'clock. She's still not there. Then maybe like three o'clock, um, her and her husband call in and he's like, she doesn't feel good. So our product manager at the time is like, look, my father's a doctor. Y'all in Manhattan. He's in Manhattan. Go see my father. No, no, no. We good. We good. We we got somewhere we're going to go. Once it's like 5, 45, 6 o'clock, everybody in Epic's leaving. I'm like, yo, I'm out. I'm not like, wow. what am I doing here? So me and Jimmy leave. We leave and I get a call around seven o'clock or seven thirty. And I'm like, yeah, so Mel showed up. Um, we think you need to call, call her. Okay. At this point is when you know Mel doesn't pick up the phone. Or LaRue answers the phone. She doesn't touch the phone. It's just you have to go through LaRue every time. So I'm like, okay, so I call LaRue. I'm like, yo, what's up? He's like, oh nothing, nothing. She's fine, she's fine, you know. It's either an eptoctic pre- pregnancy or she's pregnant, you know, one or the other, but, but she's fine. I'm like, oh, what? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm confused. I thought we had this talk, but I introduced y'all. Y'all got mad. All that's fine, right? What are you doing? What do you mean, baby? We're about to put out an album. Hey, man, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. I'm like 24, 25. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't as, you know, as cool as I am now. And and I mean, and they have the most amazing child. Like, their daughter is amazing. But then I'm just thinking business, and I'm just thinking, yeah. like, this, you know, it, I, I feel blindsided. So I speak to Mel, and I'm like, yo, what's up? It's like, nothing. How you doing? I'm like, I ain't doing that great. She's like, okay, so what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I'll probably get somebody else to just sing your song. She's like, okay, cool. Well, let me know. Here's the rule. And gives the phone back. <laughs> and that shit infuriated me. Because that was just like, that was on purpose. That whole I don't care attitude, that was on purpose. So that was like, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a big problem. So ultimately, it ended up being a blessing because she had a beautiful child. But also ended up being a blessing because that year that we sat, it was the weirdest shit. The cassette leaked to the entire record industry. Nobody in the streets heard it. But as far as the record industry, every single label knew every single record and knew every word to every, like we were literally the hottest shit in the business. It was like weird. So that was a great advantage because Epic knew like, okay, we gotta gotta take these little cool kids. We gotta take them serious now. Mm-hmm. And, then the, and then the record came out and once the DJs in New York, you know, got it. T- um, Tell Me became our last record that we recorded because we had um, under the control comp- composition clause, we need to add some more records. So it was kind of like, what do we do? So I was like, I don't know. Let's just do Tell Me Over. Like, fuck it. We did it for Rhythm and Bass in London. We gave it the trailer ends. Sony didn't like it for him. Let me and Daryl fuck with the beat and do it again. And then we just changed the beat and then she sung it. You know, it was her song to begin with, but it was just kind of full circle. But it was the last song that we recorded wow. that we didn't think anything of at all. And then it just spread like wildfire once it came out. Yeah, I mean, it was, I had Trey doing the ad lib at the back, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, it was such a, it, it was such a, I, I, as I said, it's hard to describe what kind of a song. I mean, her, her voice, but the, 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 the um, it wasn't, it was just so soothing. I mean, but you, did you not think it was, did you, did you not think this was a, you didn't think anything of it? <laughs> it was a song we heard many times. <laughs> okay. You know, and it was just like, I right, Bryce did something different to the beat. <laughs> That's all it really was. It really was like, why don't you re-sing it to this new beat I made? Same shit. Let's just get it done. That's all, that's all it was to us. It wasn't, we heard no hint of a hit record in there at all. We honestly were just trying to fulfill the amount of songs we we needed on that album. When when it, um, well, but when it blew up though, did um, did it surprise you completely? Did it blindside you? Like, wow, this is... Yeah, definitely did. Because it was, it was, you know, this is like my second success. Mantronics was probably the biggest record I've touched internationally. Mm. So I experienced how it blew up that way. Yeah. Uh, it was still, it was still heavy on the radios in America, but it it was, it was, I don't, I don't even remember how that, how that really happened. With Groove Theory, it was a thing of whenever me or me and my cousins would go out, every car that's going by is blasting this record. And we looking at each other like, what the fuck is going <laughs> on? It's just crazy. Like every single car that's going by, every club we go to and just watching everybody's reaction to it as people are like first hearing it or like, Oh, yeah. that's the song. What is that? That's, you know, yeah, that was, it was interesting. It just spread like wildflower, like wildfire. How did that, but then having that hit single when it's not the song that you really thought was going to be blown up, how does that change the, the direction of where you, where the label is going or where you're going to, you know, with the rest of the album? For me, it didn't, for me, I didn't look at it like that because every, if you notice every song group theory, nothing, not one song sounds like the other, you know? Mm -hmm. Every song is pretty much a stark difference from the song before or after it. Yeah. So to me, I was just like, all right, let's get to the next sound. You know, like 10 Minute High was a, probably our favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and 10 Minute High was definitely the favorite before Tell Me. So we were just like, let's get to that. It was the label that was like, it's not big enough. And we were like, but it's cool. And we were like, we're not <laughs> going for cool. We're going for... You know, and and that's also when you start to understand music as a as a business, as a business, as yeah. a brand. You know that being artistic and creative is not, you know, that's not the formula. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny because I used to remember watching you and thinking he's in a group, but he's not singing. Did people wonder why you didn't sing or like they they expected you to? <laughs> yeah, they um when so we did it right. And I, I was, you know, we did everything and it was like, all right, we got to do the artwork and this and that. I was like, all right. And they were like, so you have to be. And I was like, okay. And I'm going to watch Mel take her pictures. They were like, no, you in the group, you got to take pictures. I was like, I don't want to take no pictures. I don't want to be in this. I don't want to be in the camera, none of that. Yeah. I just had a, a different mentality then. So um, that's why I was faded out of the album cover. Yeah, yeah. The album was single one, but I, was, I faded myself out. I was like, get me out of focus so they really can't see me. I just be some figure. But focus on her. Yeah, but uh, there's, there's, as I said, when when I heard Trey, I thought it was you because I mean, it it it, it just Makes didn't sense. make it, it made sense that you were the because yeah. we didn't see we just yeah. assumed you you were the, the singer. But why yeah. didn't you do some rapping then? I, mean, I was done with that. Ah, uh, when I when, when I walked away from that, that was that was it. But then. So after the album blows up, I mean, and and especially at, at that time, you know, we had Kadar out, out in um, starting to the Neo Soul. So we had D'Angelo coming out, Angie Stone and Erica Badu and all that sort of vibe was, you know, moving to that um, Maxwell. So it was as, almost as if the industry was like doing away with New Jack. You know, you, you had mm -hmm. Diddy doing his stuff and you had the East and West Coast doing their stuff but there was space for the type of music that you guys were doing. There was an expectation from all of us that, okay, man, we can't wait for the follow-up. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, we were, we were, the follow-up material we had was incredible. It was really, really dope. But where we were going personally, it was never going to happen. It just wasn't. 
um when we when we put out the album me keeping myself out of the focus backfired on me ah. where amel is the star mm. as she should be she's the front person and i'm in the background which is fine but then i started getting treated like the background like oh. way 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 in the back so we had a clothing budget i say two thousand dollars i would always give it to amel i had money I'll go to Barney's, I'll spend $1,200 on a shirt and I'll go to the show. That was just part, that's just what I did because I self-funded this thing anyway, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that I didn't mind. You know, there were there were a lot of things that I felt the male needed because she's in the front. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it started getting a little crazy and I started hearing rumors. Um, the uh, Over Epic, the rumor was, well, Bryce doesn't have the talent. She's the one with the talents. When they break up, we're taking her. And I don't like, I don't like this. Just certain things don't put me in war mode. Like I'll lose every battle, but I will win the war. So when I started hearing that, uh, me and Jimmy would talk and Jimmy would be like, yo, we got to strategize something. And I'd be like, yeah, we got to, you know, we got to figure this out. And But I was, I was kind of more caught up on how can they do that? Like, this is my shit. I started it. You know, I was kind of just, a little bit more sensitive about that. And I'm young and I'm like, why? To me, I'm kind of like, for a minute, you're like a victim. Like, why me? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> and then I was like, all right, I got to flip it. So what happened was I had a big crush on Tony Braxton. <laughs> like a huge crush. Like, I'm marrying her. <laughs> She's amazing. Like, that's that's how I was when I, the first time I saw her. So Billy Woodruff, um, the director, had saw her at BET and got me a, a um, signed autograph. Wow. That's it. Something like to my future husband, see you at the Grammys, <laughs> right? So, you know, I was I was ecstatic about that. And out of the blue, I kept getting these phone calls from everybody. Everybody was like, call me, call me, call me. I'm like, yo, what's up? Your girl wants to meet you. She's in town. I'm like, Tony? They're like, yeah. Okay. So I go, I meet Tony. I meet L.A. Reed. Um, me and LA clicked immediately. I gave him some beats. He's in the studio. He's playing the beats. And, um, he's like, you know, he's a drummer. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. He's a drummer in the deal. So we, we're going to connect over the, the beat side of music. Mm. And, um, he heard it. And then, um, I just like switched over that camp. Like in New York, you have to be down with Russell Simmons, Andre Harrell, or Puff. Okay. That those, that's the gateway. Me, I went to Atlanta, circumvented everybody, and Atlanta was selling way, 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 way more records at the time. Mm. Dallas, Austin with um, ABC. Yeah, Boyd Monica. And yeah. Jermaine Dupree with Bow Wow, the Brat. All, like, Atlanta was was really moving units. And then, of course, El- TLC, you know, yeah. was yeah. the king. So, um, so a lot of that, honestly, was to, to level the playing ground. I played in Atlanta with the big boys, to level the playing ground and to leverage that against Epic, Epic. And Kukri, you know, because I, w- I was just getting played, like left every opportunity for me to get played. I was getting played. Wow. And then that switch for me doing a Tony record, Groove Theory didn't even, we didn't even go gold. And the Tony record selling 270,000 units a week, like for like 30 weeks. It's kept, it's at 20 million now, you know? So when that happened, of course, everything changed. They fired Paris Davis. I went and did a video for Craig Common Atlantic Records. I'll do this video, but you gotta give my man a job. All right, we'll give him a job. He got a job. Um, me and Jimmy moving on, you know, negotiating, you know, producing for everybody on the planet at that time. And him going back, doing these little shows with Groove Theory. It just didn't really make sense anymore. It was like, the, the power dynamic shifted back towards yeah. me. And I wanted to be like this because I would tell him, I'm like, yo, we write like these little, you know, hits that are like really easy and basic. We can write them in our sleep. Let's just do it for a lot of people. The Tony record I gave to a Mel as well. I gave the You're Making Me Hot beat to a Mel. But when I gave it to her, I was, I was out somewhere and I called the studio like, yo, let me hear the record. And it was like, yo, we got to have a talk. We got to talk about what? Well, who's getting producer credit? 
The producer. <laughs> what do you mean? The producer, the guy whose studio you sitting in singing in, he's getting the producer credit. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? And it was just like weird. Like, I'm way too rich right now. <laughs> like, you can't, like, what are you doing right now? You know, to to tell me I have to I have to make your producer. You're not producing the record. I'm the one who met them. And I'm, you know what I'm saying? And I'm promising them, I'm a, you know, I'm going to give them a great record. And they asked me for a great record. So instead of just like riding along and everybody doing a part, it was like this, like, no, I'm in the front of all of this. All right, that's cool for group day, but you're not taking that outside of group day in my space. Mm -hmm. I'm an independent producer. You're not coming in and whatever I produce, you have to do. If it comes to that point, no problem, but you're not going to tell me, you know, that that's what I have to do, you know? So I was basically like, you know, put it, put me on speaker. All y'all get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> I went and uh, you know, and then me, and, you know, me and Babyface did the record instead, and then it just became what it, you know, it became what it became, you know. So, so those are the things that led up to, you know, and I'm sure Mel's got her own side of the story. You know, mm -hmm. I've I've heard that I, I took all the Ruth Day um, royalties. Now she knows that's not true. I was like, all right, well. Find where I did and sue me. Like I, or I'll give it back to you if you can find it. It's not a problem. But all of those were the things that led up to this group. It can't possibly work. And I also always started Group Theory out with the idea to feature a new singer on each project. Okay. Yeah. They when when it was time to do the album, they offered us a hundred thousand dollars, and I was like, "Tell them to call when they're serious." And they were like, "No, we are serious." I was like. I'm not serious. Um, Jimmy went to jail. Shaquem was managing us. And Shaquem was like, no, this is cool. Take it. I was like, no, I'm, not I'm making $60,000 a track. Like, <laughs> and this is still, right? Amel is part of me. I'm killing it. So we're going to make more money. So I told Amel, like, just relax. I got it. I'll deal with the label. I didn't make her deal with it. I was still, I was using my value to make, to give us more value. Yeah. And then I got a call from Paris that said, uh, well, well, Amel wants 60000 of the 100 And I was like, well, this is Miss 50-50. I'm cool with splitting this 50-50. I don't, I, this is the last check I need right now. I would literally lose checks for fifty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in my drawer. Literally, no lie. So I'm like, I don't care about this, but I'm not going to take less than 50%. You wanted 50% of this group. Now you want 60%? No, you still want 60% of the group. But you want sixty percent of that check? That's the same thing to me. Yeah, those kind of things it just wasn't gonna fly anymore, you know, because because I'm still using what I'm doing outside to come back and and make us stronger, you know, because we were on the path to follow what the Fujis did. They came mm -hmm. out and did okay, then they came back did twenty one million. Yeah, yeah. We knew we were gonna sell at least four to six to eight million records on it. We and we had bona fide hit records on, like records that kill the first album. The first album was nothing next to what we wrote. But it just became every sing, single thing became a um, power struggle. Then um, I heard that I should be giving, I should be getting less publishing. So now I should be getting 40% of the publishing instead of 50 because someone told her that the songwriter is more important <laughs> as far as the publishing split. I was like, <laughs> right, well, not in my world, it's not. So this well, is going to stay 50 50. Well, so that's the thing, yeah. like, once those things start piling up yeah. and I'm having an amazing career outside of the group, mm. where my name is actually bigger than Groove Theory, it just, did, it just didn't make any sense. It was like, you guys had a good time. Y'all beat me up. I started this, but that's, you know, it's got to end at some point. Yeah. Cause you know, when you, when you, um, when you, um, cause now, cause uh, Phil asked me, asked Bryce why, he became Tony's love interest in the video. And now you kind of said, because you were in the background, you're like, you know, I need to, you know, I need to be shown so people could recognize me. And we all knew you did the track with Babyface. And I'm, and I'm strangely, because it was almost as if the label made a point to, put, to to highlight the fact that Bryce Wilson and Babyface did the track. Was was that something that you had a conversation with? Because it, it was well known to everyone that you were, part of that track, not just in the video, but the co-produce or produce the track. It 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 happened because um you know me and Tony was dating and she wanted me 
in the video. You know? <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to be in the video. Um, okay. You know, I was the same person. I didn't want to be in the video. Um, I told, I told him, I was like, yo, this is my man out of Brooklyn, Jay-Z. He's hot. There's another dude named DMX. I don't know him, but y'all should use, I, I was like, you should use, you know, same with Ruth there, man. I was like, I'm into contrast, right? You're Tony Braxton, get Jay-Z or get DMX. And they were like, she's not trying to hear none of that. <laughs> okay. So um, Billy Woodruff was directing the video and he just kept calling me. He's like, yo, this, I was like, ain't no way out of this. He was like, there's no way out of this. <laughs> like, you know, just shut up and, and come and do it. So then, you know, so I, so I didn't plan on doing it, but it was a hell of a chess move. It, it ended up being because it just gave me, it gave me all the leverage in the world. It was, it was, it was literally the difference of BET to MTV. Yeah. But it also exposed you to, because it, it it gave you a personality, but it get, your name became a lot more, because once your name is known by the public, I'm sure it's known by the industry as well. Mm -hmm. And so did, so you just decided, okay, yourself, Jimmy, just started to go, you know, hard on and just producing, just staying yeah. in R&B, didn't want to go into hip hop and, no, I, for me at that point, it was, I really didn't make a, a conscious decision or anything. I just naturally grew into the place that the success gave me. You know, I just, I just now would have a, you know, your schedule on the board is now filled with Whitney, Mary, this one, this one, this one. It's just your schedule's filled with artists that you wow. got to produce. So when you look at the schedule and you're making forty to $60,000 for each song you do for each one of these people, why am I going on the road? You know, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Like I, I outgrew this groove theory thing until, you know, until the next one where it, you know, where the dollars will make sense. So I stopped going on the road with groove theory. I just told Amel, you could take half my money, which I think was fair. I was like, you could take half my money, send home my half, but you're making 75% of the money now. Wow. And, and then um, she goes on to do her solo album, but it, it it didn't do the numbers or the exposure that the I, I would think the label expected, as I guess the sound is missing. You didn't you you weren't called to do anything on on. <laughs> no, it was on by then. <laughs> it, was on. <laughs> it was like you go do you, I don't do me. You know? Wow, it, there was a part of you that um, that looked at it and thought, you see, or did you? I mean, the younger version of you. I'm not. I mean. Did you think yeah, I, I, you, you thought you could do without me or had? Yeah, of course. You always think that. You know, you're always going to think that. Um, I think, I think a male kind of. Um, I think we kind of have the same disease. I think when when it comes easy to you, like when your access to that thing comes easy to you, I think you take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that. You know, me and Amel were this super, super elitist, creative, snobby, like, you know, we looked at music like, you know, we didn't respect nothing unless it was all the way up there. Yeah, yeah. And I think she kind of carried that into her solo career versus me making music really became a business. Yeah. You know, I would go out and listen and I'd be competitive. I wanted to be competitive with Pharrell, Timbaland, all that, J uh, Jermaine. We, we were all cool, but we we're all still competitive. And I think um, Amel kind of missed that thing and just stayed very creative and, you know, and in her and in her lane, you know. And if you ask her, I don't think Amel aimed to make hit records anymore. I think she just aimed to make her music. Yeah. But how how were you able to to stay af afloat when you did have, you know, Timbaland, uh, Neptunes and all these guys? It became, a, in, especially in that mid to late eight nineties, it became a, a producer sort of like labels would just go throw money at producers to make hit records and they they forget the formula of let's have the producer shape um let we have an artist and let's get the producer mm -hmm. to produce around the artist it became no we need to get some hit records from that producer and that producer how did you remain competitive to so that you were getting business with Timberland the Neptunes and JD and um um, Rodney Jerkins, you know, all of them taking, you know. That, you, you just, when you have a hit record, you automatically have a slot on everybody's record. Mm -hmm. Really. It's just whether you show up or whether you don't show up. 
you know, whether you, you know, whether you do it or don't do it. But the slide is there because you've earned it. And that's just the stupid way that the business works. The business doesn't work to break new sounds and new talent. The business works to continuously regenerate the writers and producers of the top five, the top 10, and they just keep recycling it, you know, which eventually um, hurts the business. But that's, that's what it was with me. With me, it was everybody that was about to do an album. I was just at the top of the list, you know? So it was, you know, it was pretty easy. Who, who was, who was your main lyricist then? Um... I would usually work with a lot of artists that wrote their own stuff. Me and Babyface, um, we did some more stuff. We did Whitney Houston together. We did As Yet together. We did um, For the Lover and You on his album together. Okay. Um, oh, the one with um, Shalaman Ello. Yeah. Full yeah. Circle with Todd. How- Full Circle. <laughs> Full Circle. Yeah. Yeah. So we did, We you know, we did, we did um, those records with Babyface were always good. Um, you know, I'd be around people like Lupe Fiasco before he was hot. You know, I, I always would want to deal with artists that write their own stuff. Even like Change Your Faces, they wrote their own stuff. So the, I was more into that. Um, or if I was doing like a Diane Warren record, you know, for another artist, it, then we're just coming in two formulas, you know, music, writer, and the art. I'm just there to make sure the artist delivers whatever Diane wrote for them. But yeah, it was just that kind of thing. Who, who would you say top five artists that you had in the studio producing that you really thought, well, they they delivered the the vocals to the music I put together. Um, I would say Makeda Davis, who I did the second Groove Theory album with, definitely that was the best um, the best partnership creatively. Mm-hmm. I would say Mary J. Blige. Amazing, me and her are, are, are crazy in the studio. Um, yeah, we're like she's a different beast in the studio when when I when I work with her. Um, so definitely her, Amel for sure. I think Amel is probably the probably the most talented singer I've ever worked with, singer songwriter. Mm-hmm. I've ever worked with. I, I think I would rate Amel at the at the at the top. Um, Makeda, Amel. Mary, uh, of course, Babyface. That's you know, it's a no brainer with him. <laughs> yeah. Face will go, he'll go sing the record. He'll come out, play the guitar on it, <laughs> <laughs> and he's a, and you know he's like a master teacher. Like I'm, I'm, I'm also in there learning, because mm. you know, he's really, really dope. Yeah, but I say those guys. Okay, you, you didn't include Tony. <laughs> well, she doesn't write. Oh yeah, okay, 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 yeah, okay. Right. okay. Yeah. But what were your top five records that you've produced that you what would enter your top five? Probably records people haven't heard before. Wow. I mean, commercially released. Then I mean, <laughs> I would say um, "Get to Know You Better" with um, the record I did on Mary. I would say that one. Um. I did a record with Junior Sanchez that I like called Wildfire. Um, and then just honestly, that second group there album with Makeda, I liked the whole album. We did two albums and I, I love both of them. Those became the albums that are my like Beyonce records and A. Marie, like all of those records that I gave out during that time, I stopped making music. I sold four or five-year-old records to all of these artists. Wow. Yeah, so I would say like everything me and Makeda did. Makeda comes from Devante's camp. Ah. Yeah. And when I the, when I first started out as a producer, that was like I started out mimicking Teddy Riley and um and Kyle West, but yeah. who blew my mind was Devante. Mm. Devante is not from this planet. Yeah. <laughs> I would go either to his house, because he lived like 10 minutes from me, you know, in Jersey, everybody was there. Yeah. I'd go to his house. And be like, what is his studio is a spaceship? Literally. <laughs> like you step on the floor, touch the, the door slides open, like <laughs> um, or I would go to the hit factory when they had their the the facility was brand new at the time and they had a um a room that we called the Star Wars room where the the, the console would like damn near stretch around the room. It was wow. like the 96 channel was crazy. So I would go to see Devontae in there. 
And that dude just inspired me. That Diary of a Mad Band, uh, mm. that album, best r and album of all time to me. Like, so that was really like, Devante was, was my absolute inspiration. That dude is really talented. Wow. So when I met Makeda, knowing that she came from that camp, Missy, Genuine, Timberland. Uh, was she part of sister or was she sort of- she was... I mean, they had, Devante had the, the sickest camp on yeah. the planet. Yeah, yeah, you Missy, know? Magoo, yeah, all those, yeah, everybody, yeah. genuine, all yeah. of them will, yeah. Yeah, and Static was Static one of the top three writers, yeah. you know, in, in R&B. So Static was part of it, and Makeda was part of that camp, and Makeda, I think, is the best out of everybody at that whole camp. Wow. Yeah, she's, yeah. I heard her literally over the phone, it was like, plane tickets there tomorrow. Oh, Wow. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I interviewed Dalvin, and you know, he did. You know, he, he talked about how um, his brother just said, "Look, stop playing basketball, and you, it's not going to pay your bills." You know, and, and how he just mm -hmm. got him. <laughs> but he also says his brother didn't like getting up. <laughs> he, does, he he hated it so badly <laughs> that he didn't even go in the video because that was the only track that he he was able to produce on the album. Yeah, um, both Teddy and Al have um, have said about uh, Devante that um, even Eddie F was saying about he he just had keyboards and he he just he just just lived the music and he 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 was in the that album said that he wrote Forever My Lady when he was like thirteen or fourteen. Yeah, half right. the Jody Jodeci album was written when he was when he was about fourteen fifteen. He just had the songs. Um, yeah. So I mean. So you're able to go watch him produce and stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. but he, yeah, but he was a he was an instrumental. He was a keyboard player. So yeah. did, did that bring something different as to music compared to how you produce? Or what did you think? No, I think it was just more of the sounds he used and the way he used it. Um, more than anything, that would, like just just the sounds he would use. His version of R and B was just crazy because to me he was he was like our generation's prince. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean where he was like really really left but it was a little bit of rock star yeah yeah but super super soulful you know and I didn't and I honestly didn't I never really heard gospel till I was like 19 oh uh, I forgot yeah, you didn't okay you didn't really grow up in the church like most uh, uh, most okay no so when I heard Casey and Jojo <laughs> yeah, I didn't know voices could be like that it blew my mind you know I, I had I had their first album before it came out about eight months before it came out, and I would just take a drive every single day and listen mm. to that album. Like I was, yeah, Jodeci and, and Devante was a huge, huge, huge inspiration for me. So I, when I told I told Dalvin that um, in Nigeria, because I was in Nigeria at the time, that the first part of the album, all the up tempo New Jack was big. The Forever My Lady Stay, um, mm -hmm. they went. We didn't really because we liked the more up tempo stuff. And yeah. the album says, yeah, they wanted to emulate guys. So that's why they came up with the stuff. But the mm -hmm. last chance was when they did the, the ballads, and that's when they stayed in in, in, in that in that lane. Yeah. Um so you know, in the midst of being influenced by Dalvin and, and stuff, we got to the 2000s, 20 where um, hip hop started to take over. What as a producer, what did you start to do? Did you start to think, okay, I need to go on that lane or, or how how does how does it change for you <laughs> i was gone by then <laughs> i was done wow. i was done i i retired like mid 99 early 2000 wow how come i just i just i just did a dave Chappelle. i woke up something in my subconscious something in my spirit was telling me like something's gonna go bad. Like if you keep your foot on the gas, you will hit a hell of a wall. And at to to substantiate that feeling, I just didn't like the fact that everybody was pulling me and everybody was everybody wanted a piece of me. And I kind of felt like I'm not gonna have I'm not gonna have myself anymore. You know what I mean? I just felt like um and to be honest, I just wasn't emotionally, I just didn't have the emotional intelligence to keep evolving as my business got bigger. You know, I got, I I really didn't like what was going on in music either. Like culturally, I didn't like what was going on. I didn't like hearing um, where every rapper is a gangster. Mm -hmm. I didn't like hearing that. Like I came up with real gangsters. 
and kids are going to jail. Listen to what y'all are making. So I, that was my personal stance. And it really played a part in that decision. I just really, I didn't feel like, you know, growing up, it's like we talked about the 80s, right? Yeah. You're proud. Like, you're proud to be a New Yorker. <laughs> you don't care. Like, it's New York against the world. Before that was a phrase, you know? But then hip-hop became something that I just wasn't really that proud of anymore. Mm. You know? And and m- with my own personal development, it just wasn't like... I couldn't look at me and see myself in what was going on on the TV anymore. Or when I step outside the house. I just felt very different. And I just was like... I just woke up and was like, I'm done. Wow. So you yeah, just stopped- I like keep making records and just like, I couldn't make no more hit records. I didn't make any records at all. No records. Wow. I just walked away. You would have had to staff a team of people, studio and everything. Would you just say, okay, I'm selling everything. I'm just going to move away or how? Yeah. I had, a, I had a girl that ran everything and one more assistant. Um, Keyboarders, couple of engineers. And I was like, it's the music business. Everybody figure it out, but me, I'm done. Wow. And everybody was like, you're crazy and you work so hard to get here. I was like, what? A... When you're young, you're just stupid. Nobody can tell you anything. You think you know everything. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm glad that I did walk away in some ways, but I also look at the sum product from my peers. And I look back wondering what that would have looked like. Mm. You know what I mean? Because I'm I'm a much more dynamic producer than the guy that made Groove Theory. I don't really like I I I like some of Groove Theory and I like what it represented. And I like the the um the exchange me and Amel had, but production wise, it wasn't half as dynamic as Devante or Teddy Riley or any of those people. So when I look back now, I do wish that I had a much bigger body of work. I don't have a big body of work. I have 50 million records sold that are basically like four or five records. Yeah. So I I kind of was really lucky. You know what I mean? Like now I'm looking forward to like going back to music and having some failures, having some bricks, having things people don't relate to. Like, I don't care. Like just put some music out and, and just put what I feel is dope out. And, and because you've got the opportunity to do that independently, um, are you looking to re you know a new group new groove theory a new or, or so or what are you looking to do you know what not i i i would never do another groove theory record um but i am doing this project now we're doing a um a bryce wilson presents groove theory oh mm-hmm. because we because you know this is i i think in me and amel's little back and forth Amel completely won the last one because Amel was able to go travel and make money off of performing his song. Uh, I couldn't, right? And I didn't really, I didn't really care to. I cared about me and Amel doing one more album. That was my concern. Yeah. When I understood that it wasn't going to happen, I I never looked back at Groove Theory. But um, a friend of mine, Kimana, gave me um, this idea to do Bryce Wilson presents Groove Theory. And I was like, wow, that's kind of that's kind of dope because that kind of takes away the question of is a male gonna be there? What about a male? It kind of takes away the criticism and the judgment. And instead of it being some girl singing group theory songs, mm-hmm. I want to have one or two singers sing like my catalog. Ah. You know, so you know, one could do Groove Theory, Tony, one could do Mary and Beyonce, and I could also do a lot of these Groove Theory records that were never released as well. Okay. So so music, so that's the only thing Groove Theory-wise that I'm touching is that. Um, and whatever, if it, organ- it organically grows into something, then that's fine, I'll do that. But other than that, um, I am doing a lot of work with, um, with Junior Sanchez. I love house music, I love electronic music. So um, me and Junior have a... a a project called Brigade that, that that we have to finish up. And I'm just, you know, I just want to work on anything that's cool. I'm not pressed. I'm not, I don't want, you know, I don't want to take means with labels and play the singles game or none of that crap. I, I want to, I want to build the studio and just make it a project studio where okay. you come in you're doing your whole project and that's it. So well, what made you decide to come back to music? Um, I decided a while ago to come back to music. I just never got to it because what I wanted to do was get the businesses that I'm working on in order 
um, because I don't want to do music to survive. I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to have to create to survive. Yeah. You know, I don't want to. Um, and I don't like music execs. <laughs> I, I like the chairmen at the labels. I love Sylvia, Craig Cowman, L.A. Reid, the A and R guys. I don't. I don't like. I don't really respect um, what they do. Um, Dow Jones is one guy that's. He's. I rate him. He's a really dope A um, and R guy. But the rest of them, I don't. I don't really deal with them. So I just wanna. I just wanna make music, put it out how I put it out. People take it how I take it, and I build on wherever you know wherever it gets attention. But I'm not pressed to like get back. I don't want to get back into that game. I don't. I don't really respect that game. But but um, you you you're building a new studio, or do you have one at home? And then you know because it's all it's. I got one at home, but I want to build one. I want to build like a big project studio where I can have a a, a nice size live room where I can bring in um, instrumentalists. Wow. Yeah, I really go in. I, I retaught myself how to produce um, because electronic DJs, I believe, are the best producers on the planet. R&B producers, when I look at how we produce versus them, <laughs> we're in, in this fucking stone ages. Like, seriously. <laughs> seriously, we're in the stone ages. I think Teddy is the only one out of the old school producers that understands sonically, you know, what's going on. But, uh, but I retaught myself how to produce. Um, so I want to put that with the live instrumentation. Okay. I never got to ask what your mom felt when you, when you did not just Mantronix, the groove theory, what, what, what was her reaction? Um, her, her reaction was cool. To be honest, her and my father's reaction was cool. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't, it wasn't crazy. The, 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 it, that's just how my family is. Like, you know, I see my father and, you know, ain't no hugging. I saw my grandfather two years ago before he passed. I was like, what's up, grandpa? Hey, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just like. Wow. <laughs> it was a little hard. So it was I didn't, I didn't get anything. From my mother, I only got um, the motherly things. You know, my first million dollars, she was like, okay, but you got $486,000 in losses. I was like, what's that? She's like, all the money you gave to your fucking friends and whatever. And I was like, oh, okay. So I would get that kind of stuff, you know, like, you know, stop giving away this and stop doing this or make people work before they do this. Just motherly stuff. Um, My father was still my father. He was very stern, but behind my back, he talk about his son to everybody. That's what I'm about. <laughs> so he would so he would never do it to me. You yeah, know? yeah. But you know, behind my back, he you know, he he talked about me to everybody. Yeah. So very mm. so they were very proud. They were they were very happy that I about faced my life. Mm. That was their concern. So for my mother, she was happy. For my father, he was like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. You know. <laughs> Yeah, now that was really it because I I got a call from them when I was around twenty. I got a call from both of them, and it was weird because for them to be on the same call is like, you know, <laughs> like a shift in the matrix. But they both called me and was like, "Look, we gonna help you go to college. This is your one chance." Um, but you know, we got a little money saved up, and if you want to get your life together, we'll give you some money to go to college. I was like, yo, I'm good. I don't know, you know. But, but yet you were Mantronics by this time. Or you yeah, just... it is after Mantronics. Yeah. Oh, so they didn't know what you did. They didn't know what you were. Yeah, they probably know. like, you know, that was a fluke, you know, <laughs> not to start real life, you know? Okay. okay. Let's stop playing around, you know? And I was like, nah, I'm not done. I got, you know, I'm going to recreate this Mantronics thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think finally, are you surprised how? The, the sustainability of Todd Smith from the guy you met when you were 13, 14, of 12 or so to where he's at now, you know, were you surprised that he's he's still top, not just an artist, but a musician, a film actor, heavily celebrated? Not too much because he was always just like, he always believed in himself. There's certain people, I, I'm one of them as well, but there's certain people that you can never tell that they're not going to succeed. Wow. You know what I mean? And he is by far one of those people. Like that dude is super, super ambitious and really, really take, what I'm surprised at is that he still takes it seriously, as serious as he does. Wow. I'm surprised at that because 
me, I, I don't think I, I don't think I would last. I think I'd get over it or move on to something else. But I think that, I think he's done a great job at that. Like his Rock the Bells brand is amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and honestly, I'm happy to see Todd in his own way finally coming back around and giving back. Because he's like giving Rock the Bells is one thing, but part of that brand is this 50 year celebration, and and part of, part of what they're doing is highlighting a lot of the old school guys, um, like Playboy Mikey D. Everybody grew up on Playboy Mikey D. Like Mikey D was literally the king. I don't care what borough you from, everybody knew Mikey D. Everybody knew Grandmaster Vic. So for the attention that they're getting from LL now, oh. that's that's really really awesome of him. Yeah. I, I, now that you're getting back into music production, I, I do. He's trying to. He still talks about coming up with his new album. I would have thought that you guys would have tried to say, "Let me try and get a joint on that as a producer <laughs> or even as a feature." Like, I mean, you know, if if it happens, it happens. But we, you know, we in two different worlds. You know, you know, that's that's my bro. I I used to say he was my cousin for years to help me get my foot in the door, <laughs> and, and he would never tell nobody. Nah, Bryce ain't my cousin. He always, <laughs> Yeah, that's my that's my little cousin. So, you know, that was enough. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's been fascinating. I guess a lot of us who um, have known your name but not really heard your voice, um, and and or even really your story like this. Um, and I thought you did a lot more into acting. Did, did have you stopped doing that as well? I stopped doing acting. Um, acting became just a challenge that I just didn't want to do. Music, I wanted to do more than anything in the world, and I did everything to make it. Um, acting, I didn't like the power dynamic. I didn't like that I got to go to a thousand auditions, maybe to get 50 yeses, right? Wow. And then I got to wait for some exec that don't know me to say, oh, yeah, let's give him a chance. I started acting like 32 years old. I didn't have eight years, 10 years to play around and do that. Yeah. When I was 18, I had that <laughs> time and I used that time. You know what I'm saying? And it yeah. got me some. But I, you know, I didn't have I didn't have the time or the patience to go and do that anymore. The other thing is that with music, you know, it could take one person can make a hit, two people can make a hit. It's usually two to four people that make a hit record. Mm. Film production, it's at least 30 people that gotta show up every single day. So it's such a different um, monster you need to cooperate in order to, for you to get your chance. You know, I love the I love the expression of it, but honestly, acting was another competitive tactic of myself. It was, I'm tired of having a singer, be it a male or anybody, where they can control my life by default because they want to or don't want to do something, you know, or I put them in the hot chair and they start switching up on me. So, <laughs> So I was like, you know what? Let me see what my own equity will bring. So I took on the um uh the show called Weekend Vibe, which was the TV component of Vibe magazine. Okay. I did that for NBC. And I honestly just used that platform to get used to the camera being in my face. Okay. That was it. Um, because I had did I did an audition for Soul Food, the the series. Yeah. Tracy Edmonds. Tracy Edmonds, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, I was it was it was just terrible. I was looking like this. So I'm going to the store. <laughs> okay. uh, when will you be back? Like, I, I was just a complete idiot. So that embarrassment of me <laughs> for that made me say, let me put my feet in it and, and test the waters. And then I did the, you know, I hosted that TV show and then I went into acting. So acting was honestly more of a tactic because I was like none of these haters in music could could affect me nobody could hate on me I'll go and be in my own lane I just didn't have 10 years 12 years to build a career just it wasn't that interesting to me okay did you have to go and be in LA or did were you able to do it from Miami or New York I was in LA I was in LA okay yeah okay and so the last thing you did was the game the gay the TV show yeah Probably. It was like a little thing in that. Yeah. I did a couple. I started doing after Beauty Shop, I started doing like little independent films. Okay. Because it was just giving me the chance to like be who Hollywood wouldn't. You know, Hollywood is, is 
is saying to me, you're going to be the love interest. And I'm like, can I get a gun? Like, can I? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, can I cry? Can I scream? Can I yell? So I, so because Hollywood wasn't giving me those roles and, and also Hollywood, you know, Hollywood is fixed. I, I would go on auditions and kill it. And they're like, wow, you're amazing. But this is for Derek Luke. I'm like, okay. Or this is for Laz Alonzo. I'm like, okay. So they set up who they want. Mm. And I just don't have it to play that game. I don't want to go play golf with five actor friends. I don't, I don't, like, I don't want to do none of that stuff. Like, uh, you know, I'm just not into it. Me and, me and Idris were very close for a lot of years. And he was just in the position I was when I started music. You know, so I was like, and I used to tell him, like, you deserve this. Because you're putting in the work I did when I did music that I am not mm. prepared to do now, you know? Yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm fine with the decision. I feel like if I really want to go back to acting, I feel like I'll go through music. Yeah. You know, because I didn't use, I didn't leverage music to get into acting. You know, I went to film school, like I did it, the, I did the grind. Oh, so okay, okay. Yeah, nobody knew who, nobody knew who I was. I was just a guy on the street that actually had to work to get to where I got. Now I'll use I'll leverage music. <laughs> 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 the music stuff. You know, maybe score a movie and you know, take a role in it or something like that. But yeah, I'll I'll do things like that, no problem. Wow. Well, but I, I always end by asking my guests that if you were stuck in an elevator and you had to watch a favorite movie to pass away the time, what movie is your favorite? Hmm. I would say I gotta go to my old time favorite. Yeah. Eat. Oh, okay. The uh, Al Pacino, De Niro sort of cop. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I was. I, I. I wanted them to do a mafia film where they were both rival mafia bosses. So when you know, and that, and they, they almost said that 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 meeting was not even filmed. Well, they weren't even really in the the, uh, the yes. cafe together. Yes. Was, was that true? They weren't. Think? They weren't there. They were not in that booth together. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, they, they, which they, is they crazy. <laughs> Okay. I get it though, but it's but it's you know that's that's the that's the magic of the camera. Like that's amazing that they did such an intense scene sitting across from each other. And when they sat across and from each went, other. I mean, yeah. they've been in films subsequently. Well, then, yeah. What's your all time favorite song? Not your song, but just this, you know, like your your go to song that you know. Um, uh, my all time favorite song. It changed. It was. Um. It was a song for you, Donny Hathaway. Um, Cause I first heard him at like 19 too. So it was that. And now it's a song called When October Comes uh, from Nancy Wilson. Oh, wow. Which is a perfect song. I never heard the song until my father's funeral. Oh. And at the service, they played and I was like, what the hell is this? My sister's like, this is, this is dad's favorite song, stupid. I was like, it is? I never heard it before, but I play it like, Three times a week. I love that record. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Good that and, and and um the Jay-Z blueprint album I'll just play every week from the end. <laughs> oh good. I think, that's, I think that's a perfect album. Wow. Oh, and your top five producers. Who who your top who would who would enter your top five producers top Hall five of Fame? Producers. Hmm. Bugs. And in no particular order, you don't have to say who's number one, but okay. just your top five. Yeah. In no particular order, Bugs, oh. Prolific, uh, Wiz from the Buchanan's, Babyface, Teddy Riley. Okay. Yeah, uh, Teddy's my all time favorite. But what is it about him? That really, um, because I know, I mean, I, I got into music. My love of music was always stemmed from him, back from, you know, hearing him do the show. And and I loved his Kumo D stuff and anything he did, I bought and stuff. But for yourself, what 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 makes him, you know, the, the genius the producer? soundtrack to our lives. <laughs> 100%. You got to understand something, right? You in New York... If you're in the streets, you could buy some stuff. If you're not in the streets, you got to work hard and you got to get your little skinny chain with your little pendant or maybe a little one ring, right? <laughs> These, they were the first R&B group that dressed like hustlers, drove cars like hustlers, 
had the girls like hustlers <laughs> and there was constantly as far as we could see a party around him wow so when you talk about aspirational it the music was absolutely mind blowing super progressive but then look the look behind it you got Teddy with the shades on you got Eric, <laughs> you got Damien i mean it, it was just three fly guys that had like amazing and it was the coming it was coming of age era you know what i'm saying mm. this is like you're like guy came out i was like 16 years old this is like first girlfriend time mm. this is first party time you know what i'm saying this is first club going this is you know what i'm saying this is like it was such a coming of age era and that was that was the soundtrack because remember everybody came in and out with records yeah there was always a hip hop hit coming on but nobody had like an album like the whole project where you loved probably nine out of ten songs mm. you know what i'm saying and then when i the thing with telly is i listen to him now and i just sit there like how the hell does his shit still sound like this like 30 years 35 years later it's mind-blowing to me like he was he's so he's so gifted as a producer as well as as a musician because sonically, how the hell does this dude? It, it sounds amazing still after all these years. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like you play his mid tempos are as dynamic as the best up tempos. His ballads are as dynamic as the best mid tempos. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like there's just too many factors with, with Teddy that all hit A plus. Like yeah. everything about what Teddy did was A plus. And especially the, the damn the guy records are just amazing. And the black street. Yeah, but mine was my favorite was the uh, "Make It Last Forever" album. And then that, and then <laughs> I mean, that. I mean, he, I, it, yeah, I think that whole album he did the whole album, and 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 you start to, you know, the keyboards and the whole stuff, and um, I, I, yeah, to to me that's just probably his best work. Um, as much as I love the guy stuff, I think his best work was sort of "Make It Last Forever." Then the yeah. Bobby album, I think he took things to another. I, for, I forgot about both of those. <laughs> I forgot about both of those. Like, yeah, the, the come on, my prerogative. Like, yeah, that but, dude yeah. is so. Yeah. He was. This is the thing with Teddy. I know when Tommy came out, I changed the radio. Period. That little one-two beat just it goes with your Brooklyn bop. It goes with this down set. It. It changed radio, right? Every song after that did the same, you know, the same beat progression. But I was only allowed to do my little change of radio because Teddy did the biggest change of music and culture and radio all at once. He did he did the big, like literally, it was the biggest change in music. We grew up on soul music. Ah. We worshiped everything from the 70s. Remember something, the 80s was an experimental decade. The 80s had shit music. It had great music, but it had shit music because it was the introduction of electronic instruments. Okay. Right? Who was the dopest and the most consistent? Teddy. Doper and more consistent than Prince. Prince did Purple Rain. That's amazing. But he's older and it, this shit wasn't hood. Teddy's was big. It was urban. It was pop. And it was hood at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, Teddy Teddy wins that all day. And sonically, just the way his records are mixed is just mind-blowing. You can play it on any speaker, an old speaker, analog, the, the new circuitry from any brand new speaker company, and Teddy's shit goes sound amazing. Yeah, when I speak to, um, when I spoke to, when I interviewed Rodney, he said that, you know, Teddy, Teddy engineered, he mixed, but he only had so much going on that he started to get engineers and mixers to join in. But he and even even John Marie Hubbard said, "Look, Teddy was better than than all of them as mixing and engineering yeah. and and stuff." But he was yeah. just had so much happening. And as mm -hmm. I said, um, yeah, from Dave Way to all all his engineers, Kissing Game, um, I like um, you know you, you can um, just got paid. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Then he did the stuff with Coop, and I even I even wonder because you were such an LL fan when he did all I go to work and and um, uh, how you like me now and Wild Wild mm -hmm. West and all that stuff. I mean, when he was on the Kumo D side, did you think 
oh man, Todd, we need to get Marley to to sort of fight back. Or did you were you involved now? In did you? No, no, it? not at all. That was that was a, a super smart move on Todd's end to get with Marley Marl. That was that was historic. That was historic, and especially because you know his his little beef with Kumo D. You know, yeah, Kumo D had Teddy Riley behind him. That was. <laughs> You know that's a that's a big one, you know. Yeah. And and Kumo D is my homie too. He's he's dude is a, personally he's a, he's a, a genius. He's a different kind of guy. But I think um, yeah, that LL thing with with Molly Mall. It's like with Teddy, you have to go organic. You have to use real drums for your samples. Wow. Because if you go this route, he's killing you. It's like you go in the ring with Mike Tyson and <laughs> put two boxing lessons. It's never, it's it's never gonna work. So I think that the Marley, the the um the Marley Mall thing, the contrast of it with the samples he used, um, all of that was it was it was it was great for Ty because any anything Teddy touched, you know, back then was just like yeah. <laughs> you know, he he was he was a it, look. It's only thirty years later that I say I imitated Teddy in order to beat what New Jack Swing was doing. Because I couldn't do it then. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Uh, Bryce, it's been amazing. Um, when you do come up with your stuff, let me know because we can get, get you plugged and let people people know and, and really support your stuff. Um, because as I said, you know, it's you know, you 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 really came out with some stuff and um and then you just sort of disappeared. But it, I'm glad that you're coming back in um because most of us are starved with good creative music and so um, we do look forward to stuff. Um, do we have any time frames or dates that we may? No, I'm gonna put something out this summer. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing these shows. Um, I, I was trying to get my I was trying to get my head right. To be honest, I was trying to get my head right to do this, but what's happening is circumstances are coming in, and that's kind of just like when circumstances come in, I'm gonna show up. So these groove theory shows that we're doing, all that stuff, that's kind of um getting me back in the mode, you know, cause I know I'll do a show, you know, they might clap for this, boo for this, <laughs> go back in the studio, fix that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's going to be a big part of the driving force behind whatever I do next. Okay. Yeah. But I'll be looking out and, and as I said, definitely if, um, if any, any promotions that we need to do on your behalf, uh, we definitely be there to, to let, 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 let the community know and stuff. That's great. I appreciate that, brother. Yeah. So I appreciate the time. I, I know I kept you for just over two hours. So <laughs> I appreciate Damn, that. that long? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, I'm a therapist. So, you know, I, I, I sort of it's the, not an interview. It's more of a an unsung in a sense. So that's 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 and we got to do it again because I definitely need some therapy. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, as I said, whenever. Yeah. Just 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 whatever it is. I mean, it's easy for me. So it's about after t it's almost midnight here. And my kids are in bed, my wife's in bed, so then it's easy for me just to have the space um at this time. But yeah, any 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 time, you know, and, and as I said, um just hearing your story and everything, uh, you know, there's a lot that I was I I don't have so many notes. I don't talk about the music as much, but I, I want to focus on you, the journey and everything. So whenever it is, just just let me know. And especially when you're about to come out the music, we'll definitely a uh, Carl West. I've had two interviews with him. I think a combined through four and a half hours and we still have some more coming in because we're just talking about, you know, he just, we, we, I'm we're meeting up with him, I think on Wednesday and we're mm -hmm. just going to talk again about Teddy and Eddie F and, and, yeah. and, and all that stuff. And it's just, just, it's just a space, you know, that's, that's, yeah. and I'm just listening. So whenever you're ready, just, just, uh, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I definitely keep that in mind. The only thing I would need is some photos because there's hardly any pictures of you around. So if you yeah. do have any okay. updated photos, that 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 will definitely be great. Okay, I'll get that over to you. Yeah. All right, Bryce. I appreciate right. it and everything. Thanks a lot, man. Take care. All right. Hey, guys. I want to talk to you about being a member of Halftime Chat. As a member, you get the full interviews on day one. You actually get some exclusive interviews, some interviews that don't get broadcasts, you get some behind the story stuff, you get some unedited stuff, quite a lot of things that will be happening for our members. There's been a lot of you who've been members and supporting us, and I really appreciate every single one of you. But as I said, just for the rest of you, think about joining the Halftime Chat membership and just see the fun that you get just being part of this growing community, celebrating R&B, celebrating hip hop, celebrating old school. So 
But thanks for watching and being part of this. Take care.